So, you know, I'm just really, really, like, glad that, that finally uh, justice has prevailed, you know, um, uh, the, the, the ruling against uh, Israel, the, the, you know, the, they've basically been doing genocide and, uh, you know, the, uh, the International Court of Justice because um, Israel are famous, aren't they, for following international law? Like, they're famous for uh, looking at international law. They look at it, they see it, they see what's yeah. going on. International yeah. law has famously worked out really well for the people of Palestine. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely been the most important thing to protect them from um, the people who basically set and enforce international law. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is a very um, true thing that we yep. just said. And we... <laughs> Have We're not so being much sarcastic. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So absolutely not being sarcastic is it at all there. We definitely um we definitely believe that Israel will um will comply and definitely won't retaliate by um coming after the UNRWA. No. Um, any anything they do, I'm sure that would just be a coincidence if they yeah. um tried to designate them as a terrorist group themselves um especially no, if they force other nations yeah. into um into uh pulling their funding that would be yeah purely a coincidence i'm sure yeah, um not retaliatory <laughs> whatsoever um, it's red planet <laughs> yeah, yeah. welcome in uh to welcome everyone in. watching and listening to the show uh it's me your boy dj mule and conquest of dread tim mm -hmm. um we're, we're, let's kick off the show tim you weren't with us last week well what was the most base thing that you did over the last two weeks Ooh, um uh get blood yeah 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 dope that's great <laughs> Um, yeah, I've been, I've been a little busy. Um, it's all right, but yeah. Uh, what, what about yourself, Mion? I have, uh, well, it's always tenants union stuff, um, but I could go into a little bit of detail about what I've been doing this week. I'm always happy to do that. You always have so much detail on tenants union stuff. You know, it's actually, it is actually ridiculous because I do think, um, that, um, the, the, I'm always not doing enough with the with the tenants union but when i think about how much stuff i forget about that i've done then i'm like oh no yeah i do a load of i do a load of stuff every single week almost every day <laughs> for this for the, for this organization um so you know and uh, well ultimately it's not just for the org it's 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 for renters rights right you know that's that's the whole that's the whole deal uh but yeah no this week i have um been in meetings with uh, a couple of members uh two absolutely wonderful gay guys um they're just like the sweetest the sweetest guys i've ever met but they're rightfully so mad um at their social housing provider for just basically like standard stuff disrepair they've been left without water uh about six times Oh no, sorry. I think it's four times a year that water gets cut off and that's happened consistently since 2015. Um, it's just an absolute joke. I also think that um, they've been suffering from uh, a lot of like damp related issues as well. Um, but most of the stuff is also like really, really bad illegal stuff. So we're talking like no proper fire alarm stuff. And it was such a joke. Like when i because the meeting was with the social housing provider like a representative from the social housing provider there were two of them there there were a couple of people from the council uh there were some councillors uh and uh, amna abdul latif one of the councillors from labor who defected due to their view on palestine she's now like an accomplice of mine i guess and like we just hang out i guess uh <laughs> she was sat next to me uh along with another councillor called abdi who's uh, a great guy as well and um yeah we were basically just there like listening to this social housing provider just just provide all these awful awful responses like oh i'm so sorry that this has happened to you this has clearly affected you really badly uh and uh, we're going to do everything we can to sort this out and it's like you know chris and gerwin our members were sat there going yeah but we've emailed you multiple times every single time this happens you keep saying that it's going to get sorted it never does and these are just the kind of things that our flat is experiencing so it was really frustrating just to see them like just not 
take any of this seriously. Um, it's always the case with, with social housing providers, though. It's literally always the case. They just defer, 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 defer. Um, my honest assessment of the situation is that they're not dealing with people's disrepair in their flats in order to, like, force them out and, and uh, redevelop the property so they make it, like, all schnazzy and nice and then they could probably sell all the apartments in that property to landlords and make it all private landlords instead of social housing, which is, uh, yeah, really cool uh, symptom of the privatization and, and deregulation of our housing uh, 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 under the Tories. Uh, that's really cool and fun. Um, what else was there in, in this? Yeah, there was a moment in this meeting where basically our members turned around and said, I'm going to supply you with an image. This is a, a smoke alarm that's not been changed since we moved in. And I think they moved in in like 2013, 2014. And on the image, it said recommended, um, um, I think, removal or reinstallation date, 2016. And this picture was taken in like 2023. <laughs> and this the, the absolute audacity of this one representative from the social housing company said oh those dates are just recommendations oh yeah yeah it's just a, a loose guideline we just laughed we all laughed it was like that's a joke that's a joke you're putting people's lives at risk like what are you doing um yeah just just a joke so i was there to support our members with that um and uh you know we're, we're keeping it on the hush because i doubt i doubt that you know your housing group are going to be watching this stream uh if they did i would be uh, uh pretty impressed that they would be wanting to hear about this kind of stuff uh but uh you know we're keeping it on the low what actions we've got planned if uh, they don't sort of act on this stuff within a decent time frame um i've also been helping members with uh, uh section 21 stuff we just we just constantly constantly now get section 21s and we're constantly having to like ask our um affiliate like i don't know if it's the right word affiliate we, we have a relationship a working relationship with greater manchester law center who do stuff uh with legal aid for people on benefits um a lot of the people who come to us that need to be referred to the law center are people on benefits. But yeah, if we, if we get, if we get someone who's got a section 21 order and they're not in the financial position to like find another house or at the very least have like a support network that can like put them up until they find somewhere else to live, then we do have to like take that super seriously um, yeah. as like a, you know, a, a, a really difficult situation. So we always put that to the law center. So I was doing that for one member today. And in the process, I was also training three other members um, who are, you know, now being trained. I mentioned last week uh, we had like a bunch more people excited to to join the union and uh, get involved with volunteering and helping members in their disputes. So I've been training them up a bunch this week. Uh, uh, it's been it's been really difficult. You, you have to you have to like try and find parts of disputes that are going to be really helpful for new volunteers to hear and to and to witness so for example me writing um a letter on behalf of like a, a member who's like sent us a letter we basically edit it they 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 write the letter and then we edit it and then we we change it to include language like our member this and like this is what our member demands and then we include a bunch of the uh, uh you know the law and legislation and what they've broken and stuff like that in those letters so i think that stuff is good for people to witness so they uh, uh a bunch of them came and watched me do that today and then one of them stayed on to speak to a member with me about this section 21 stuff um so that's been really helpful so yeah every 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 week the union's power is growing at the minute and it's actually a little crazy because it's uh yeah i don't know like i've been i've been in this union now for two years ever since i've, I've been on red planet and um it's just wild to see how we've gone and how we've grown over the last two years and it is tangible and it is really meaningful that the, the the union had an all party parliamentary group steering meeting on saturday in our branch in harper hay uh and that was wild because it was like there were people there you know from different parties who are wanting to get re-elected in in greater manchester uh, and they were hearing our concerns about housing and it's like, okay, wow, this is the power that we've got now. Uh, you know, we, we can like get these people in a room and go, yo, listen, we need to 
we need to fucking talk about this. We need to talk about housing and stuff. So that's been really, really good to see. Um, so that's been me this this week. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's like, yeah, it's been amazing to see it develop over the time that we've been doing uh, Red Planet. It's been amazing. Um, yeah, I remember one of our first ever kind of listener homework things was to go out and get involved with a, an org or something like that. Um, so I wonder if there's anyone out there that's been having you know had a similar trajectory um if you have yeah. if you have if you're a red planet listener and you've done that um let us know because we love to do little highlights of our based viewers so you know if you if you have something like that that you've done or you want to up, update us on something that you've written in in the past to uh to talk about then um yeah let us know like we have a base viewer this week yucca mountain johnny uh johnny sent us some photos from the california state university protest on monday this past week where they were taking action with their union the walkout timed for the start of the spring semester saw thousands of professors and lecturers refuse to show up for work and demand of higher wages Though the strike was planned to last at least five days, by that evening, a deal had been struck for a retroactive 5% pay rise, an additional 5% raise to arrive later in the year, and an improved salary floor and increased parental leave. So congrats to the CSU faculty for this win. We at Red Planet hope this action at the largest university system in the US leads to further organized response. Uh, thanks to Yucca, Mountain Johnny for sharing their based activity with us. So um, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty cool. That's like exactly the kind of stuff that we like to hear about. Like, and hearing that they had planned for at least five days and it just took one day in the evening they uh they had it done like imagine that like you could increase the quality your quality of life in a single day all it takes is a uh, spread in the good word <laughs> with a bunch of friends um so yeah we love to hear it we love to hear that kind of stuff so I will get cracking with the news. Um, <clears throat> so we're starting with British stuff. Uh, I'm really sorry. Content warning, Britain. Content warning, British stuff. Uh, unelected, undemocratic, horrific uh, situations as per usual in uh, 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 the UK. Uh, but this news story is 293 British MPs voting in favour of the offshore petroleum licensing bill. Uh, now, this is uh, not just as bad as it sounds. It's even worse in a lot of ways. Um, we're going to talk about that real quick. Uh, this week in the UK Parliament, 293 MPs voted in favour of a bill that enables the government to keep opening new oil and gas drilling operations. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said that doing this was entirely consistent with the government's goals to make Britain reach net zero by 2050, just taking uh, a leaf out of Israel's book here in just saying that what you're doing is really good and progressive, actually, and actually what's happening is you're killing people, um, which is a lie. Yes, it's a lie that he, that he said that. Uh, what's far more consistent with, what it is far more consistent with is the consolidation of ruling class power and flagrant disregard for the millions who will be killed by climate change in favor of profit. The Times of India reported that Infosys, a company founded by Sunak's father-in-law, signed a $1.5 billion deal with British Petroleum last year. Funny how that works, isn't it? Funny how that's all connected. Uh, a group of 12 academics and MPs published a letter in The Guardian condemning the bill, which said, It is beyond doubt that the offshore petroleum licensing bill is performative politics. Not only does this bill fail to make Britain energy independent, but it does nothing to support oil and gas workers. And, ha and as has been admitted by the energy secretary, it won't lower bills either. The construction of new oil and gas projects also threatens our ocean wildlife and undermines the UK's commitment to protect 30% of the sea for nature by 2030. This bill does achieve two things, however. First, by sowing division, it fractures the UK's valuable political consensus on climate action. And second, 
it sends an unmistakable message to the global community that Britain is no longer a leader on this critical agenda, but a laggard doubling down on fossil fuels and holding back the transition to renewables just at the moment when we should be accelerating. This is, of course, just yet another move by the British government to protect profit over people's lives and our planetary future. And they're going to keep doing things like this until people realize that they could do something about that. Tim, have you got any thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, it's almost like... Um... <laughs> And so, yeah, I feel like, so we talk a lot about different forms of activism and different, you know, like different protests and all this kind of stuff. And it's, uh, we're going to get into this, you know, like obviously in the meat of the episode, but um, it's like, isn't it interesting that there's such a disproportionate um, pushback or like state response to anything that kind of targets these particular kind of um, you know like these particular uh, I'd say like you know like apparatus like you know like the energy kind of like well you know petrochemical industry and its derivatives and all that kind of thing um, when so many of these protests and these actions are like relatively simple um yeah we'll we'll get back into this a little bit later but it's kind of interesting how yeah so many of these so many of these actions that people perform all it takes is like yeah just the most basic equipment a handful of people to um yeah to really like shut down a shut down a factory or um yeah we're going to get into a little bit later talking about palestine action again with the london stock exchange and what their plans were and um you know obviously how that kind of shook out for them but yeah it's it always strikes me as like this is it doesn't take that many people you know it's not you know it's um there's obviously a lot of stuff that goes into planning to do something successfully but um yeah it's hmm isn't that interesting <laughs> anyway um we at red planet neither um endorse or you know condone any illegal activities never we're completely neutral never never encourage you to go do anything about that but it is interesting we're centrist actually on that matter yeah, yeah. both sides are just as bad as each other <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. The people, the people that will die in the climate apocalypse are just as bad as the people that that profit immensely from um, the apocalypse and go and live in their um in their um, space station Elysium <laughs> <laughs> utopias while the rest of us um drown or burn. Um, where it's it's all you know it's, all it's exactly the, the same, same. it's yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. the same yeah. when you when you look at it when there's in a nuanced you know <laughs> perspective um <laughs> so um yeah so next the next in the news here we've got um over in argentina one day general strike sees tens of thousands marching against president javier Malay's shock treatment economic policies so um yeah this has been going on um we all know the argentinian ancap president uh javier malay who has been yeah uh bringing a whole bunch of new policies that have basically um yeah made things extremely hard and will make things extremely hard going into the future for the working class over there um yeah he's been in office for less than 50 days at the time at from today um but the far-right libertarian has already dissolved a huge number of government ministries and brought in a huge wave of deregulation uh for example extending job probation periods from three months to eight so that employers can fire new employees without notice or severance for over half a year into their contract and pushing for the privatization of state enterprises in response tens of thousands of workers have marched this week as part of a one-day general strike with signs saying things like eating is not a privilege and stop robbing retirees the strike was organized by cgt a labor union with seven million members in concert with other smaller unions in argentina yeah cgt are a gigantic union we've mentioned them before um 
and it's yeah it's absolutely wild uh we we see this a lot in countries all around the world it actually happened down here in new zealand a long time ago with the um privatization of a whole bunch of different public services that basically kind of um it's you know it's like the short term profit and for the country of like selling off these public things um then these corporations come in and buy that stuff and then they make gigantic profits over years um and you know it's just that typical kind of corporatism thing where they just try to run the services as cheaply as possible <laughs> have no obligation to actually keep things going and yeah you end up like yeah like over here our public transport systems are just like terrible um you know you even have like like over in the states like the like the way things work with like um hospitals and everything like that like that's kind of well hospitals and insurance and all that kind of stuff like that these are all you know the results of public services becoming privatized and eventually just being turned into really shitty companies and so um yeah the president over there is just doing that to absolutely everything he can um and so yeah his his beliefs and policies are congruent with the history of global free market imperialist extraction. So countries become client states of the American empire and have all of the value sucked out of them for the benefit of the United States. So that's like, you see these American corporations coming in and buying up, um, you know, like the public services basically. And so instead of if it's public, any money that goes into it just goes back to, you know, the public or whatever, but because it's private, they're going to the business and that business doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, based in that country, even paying taxes in that country. Sometimes there's a lot of tax avoidance and these kind of things, but um, yeah. So Malay has been a, a big proponent of dollarizing the Argentine economy. And this has been met with popular support that saw him elected because of the relative simplicity of dependence on the dollar compared to Argentina's nightmarish economic system beforehand. So another thing congruent with American imperialism is Malay's claim that the country needs shock treatment to recover economically. A reference to the politics of Chilean dictator General Pinochet, who used mass kidnapping, torture, rape, and murder of political opponents after a US-backed coup to allow Chile to become a laboratory for neoliberal economic policies. Like that's why a lot of people, you often hear the phrase um, neoliberalism was created in Chile. So um. Despite its supporters claiming that the free market just needs to be left alone with as little interference as possible, neoliberalism has always been brought to bear through bloody and violent authoritarianism. Yeah, that's the thing, right? It's like um, neo neoliberalism is the, you know, like they'll, they say that it's like economy first, people second or whatever like that, but it's not even that. It's like economy first and like people like, they're not even on the list, you know? Literally never. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like... Yeah, it's um, neoliberalism is, um, it's, it does, like it goes, neoliberalism, libertarianism, and fascism kind of all go hand in hand together. Um, it's just, neoliberalism is kind of like the, um, the, I would say it's seen as being more permissible on the world stage. It's kind of like global hegemony is like, that's what America and the UK kind of are working on putting everywhere so uh yeah and yeah obviously it, it, it comes through generally fascism is the the entry point but um yeah so uh the striking workers were with riot police as malay's security minister patricia bullrich said that the administration would not be defeated she also called the organizers mafia labor unions Part of a consistent strategy by Malay's team of painting work or organizing as corrupt and criminal. So, like, in my opinion, labor unions could do a, could learn a lot from the mafia. And like, I think, <laughs> I think that, yeah, we're actually, we're going to talk about this later as well in regards right. to organizational structures of you know activist groups and stuff. Um, I think um, you know, there's there's when 
and I, there are there are different mafia like organizations that have arisen out of trade unions over the years or like mm. collectives of disenfranchised working class people um you know lump and proletariat sort of thing it's kind of um yeah like <laughs> i think so to say oh mafia labor unions obviously they're making the connotations of like oh they're like these violent criminal thugs or whatever like that but um i think it's when for a government to say that about its opposition is hilarious because it's like, oh, they're they're illegal because you're you're making them illegal. You know, they're operating outside of the law because you're forcing them to. Not that um, not that I don't think any of that is actually happening here. It's just the government talking shit on labor organizers um, and implying that they're like strong arming people and, you know, forcing them to get involved, you know, like that kind of idea of like a protection racket, like you've got to join the union and stuff, but it's like, but the union is legitimately the, the only way, well, unions and other collectives are the only way that people can really fight back against this kind of thing. So, um, right. Well, yeah, it's, yeah. it's one of those, it's like, it's, it's funny that they, compare it to a mafia because like why why you have to ask yourself why do gangs exist right so mm -hmm. gangs normally exist because of economic you know uh, uh you know they, they don't have like a lot like in areas where people don't have a lot, a lot of economic opportunities like you know famously the mafia comes out of like Italy and and you know yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a lot of economic uh, in instability in Italy in like the 1930s and earlier like um, and in the same way like the mafia mafia and gangs wouldn't exist if there weren't a lot of problems in neighborhoods surrounding like not just economic instability and precarity but also how the police treat people yeah yeah mafia and, and gangs actually famously do not get on with the police and you know, yeah, there's definitely like a lot of exploitation that happens and, and racketeering and like, you know, protection money that's given and it's arguable as to whether that protection money is, is, is actually protecting anyone who has to pay it or whatever. Um, but, you know, there's another gang that goes around and, and demands that people pay the protection money and that's the police. Famously, <laughs> the Stonewall riots happened because um, apparently the Stonewall Inn didn't pay the police protection money at the right time when it's definitely proven that they did uh, and so they came in to like you know ransack all the queer people in there um you know well in the same way that like you know the mafia exists because the police are terrible and they don't actually do their job of protecting people um unions trade unions exist because companies do a terrible job and they don't protect workers it's like actually very similar you know so uh, kind of a bit telling in in the comparison that he's made there but yeah sorry to interrupt you there tim no no i think it's fine and like this idea that it's like it's mafia like to demand like union dues and all this kind of stuff and it's kind of just like obviously no one likes giving money away but you really like for a good union you're getting you know you're getting your money's back like if like what we saw earlier uh, with our based our base viewer yucca mountain johnny um you know the csu faculty got what five percent pay rise and additional five percent coming later that, that, next year that's that's sick that's a win you know like that's there's your union dues paid for right there so um yeah so the one day strike of course was just a demonstration of worker power and the rapid response by the unions to Malay's economic shock treatment means that we'll be watching Argentina closely for further developments in the struggle. I think um, how things go in Argentina is definitely going to set the stage for how things happen in South America. And I think South America is usually a good kind of um, thermometer for, I would say, like socialist activity in general, you know, like, yeah, you can get a good reading of what what's happening by looking at what's happening uh, down in South America. But um, Mule, what's, uh, what's, what's going on in Yemen? I've been hearing, hearing a lot about Yemen lately whole bunch of stuff going on in Yemen. That's right, Tim. Uh, the Houthis are continuing to attack imperialist logistics, this time hitting a British oil tanker, uh, the Martin Luanda, amid US and UK airstrikes. So earlier this week, the US and the UK launched another series of joint airstrikes against Yemen, with the governments claiming in a joint statement that they were protecting the, quote, free flow of commerce and restoring stability to the red sea um trying to imply that there was any kind of uh you know 
stability going on there that they had protected that they're, that they're a part of for some reason uh, this is in response to the attacks made by political and military organization Ansar Allah, uh, also known as the Houthis, against ships passing by the Yemeni coast in solidarity with the Palestinians suffering genocide at the hands of Israel in Gaza. Uh, former Prime Minister and current Foreign Secretary Lord David Cameron said that the UK wants a ceasefire in Gaza and that the Houthis' claims of solidarity shouldn't be accepted. But since he's going to Israel shortly to ask for a ceasefire, it seems like a case of actions speaking louder than words. And like the public pressure on the UK government combined with the actions of the Houthis against international logistics may be starting to have an effect. U.S. President Joe Biden has asked whether the strikes in Yemen were working and offered the cryptic response. Well, when you say working, are they stopping the Houthis? No. Are they going to continue? Yes. We uh, commented on that, me and Kira, in the show last week and just, you know, what kind of a telling response that is. Houthi attacks on ships in the Red Sea haven't killed anyone, while the Houthis say that the airstrikes have killed seven people, and of course Israel has killed over 26,000 people in Gaza as of Friday. In an hour-long speech uh, this week broadcast on various Arabic media, Houthi leader Abdul Malik al-Houthi said it was a great honor and blessing to be confronting America directly. Uh, and uh, yeah, I can't say in any words just how based that is actually it's probably one of the most base things ever <laughs> um yesterday the houthis hit a british oil tanker the martin luanda in the red sea a houthi spokesman said this was in response to the american british aggression against our country there was a fire resulting from the attack on board the tanker which has been extinguished and the crew are safe confirmed by the operating operating company trafigura who said they will no longer be sending traffic through the area as a result of the attack so again you know more more evidence that these attacks are working uh no you know more and more evidence that actually if you attack the commerce if you attack the purse strings uh hit them where it hurts hit them in their wallets uh of the imperial core then you will get results um and they are proving that with with more and more attacks uh uh you know going forward Tim, have you got any thoughts on this? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just keep thinking about like there's so much um, media attention to like, well, like I would say, yeah, time given to people saying like, oh, you know, they're, they're attacking civilian ships. They're, you know, like they're doing all this kind of stuff. But like literally, like America do that all the time. <laughs> and Israel have done it a bunch themselves. Um, America famously has been, um, like literally just stealing commandeering ships taking oil to venezuela like so many times over the years um but literally just like you know boarding a ship taking it over and sending taking the oil to america um and it's like you know like they're allowed to just do that people aren't talking enough about that because they act like what yemen are doing is like some like unprecedented thing like people saying like this is like the return of like the age of piracy it's like no like this stuff never stopped yeah like what 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 else would you call the 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 domination of the imperial core on the oceans of the world like you know if we're gonna talk about strong arming control uh dominating and taking resources from people then uh, imperial core navies are, are absolutely responsible for that yeah 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 it's um it's wild because so you know in yemen uh like operating around you know they're operating in yemeni waters everything like that um whereas yeah these other nations can just do it like wherever they want in the world <laughs> if you if you've got the backing of america the uk israel you can just do whatever you want you can you can kill all the people on board you can do whatever you want and it's just like damn like that's not piracy that's yeah that's that's the world police it's um yeah it's bizarre and i mean like you know with all the ansarala houthi kind of stuff it's like i think um as an act against imperialism it's like so powerful and like the and it's wild how how brave this like small little nation is you know and obviously i know they've got like issues and stuff going on there like but um 
since all this has happened, they were like the first to jump in. Like as soon as things started happening with um things uh, with well, as soon as things started kicking off in a big way with Palestine again, Yemen were like, Yep, we stand with Palestine. There are boys. They've been and Yemen has been under bombardment by the states for like you know the last 10 years or so like constant bombing anyway and they were just like right in there straight away you know um and the way that the country has actually kind of um stood together has become more unified like there's a lot of stuff now where there's groups that have because yeah Yemen has kind of been having a little civil war moment for a while now and groups that are allying together now in a risk as a response to us and uk and israeli aggression because they're just like okay well this is you know this is what's more important than our ideological differences or whatever um i think that a lot of places around the world uh like i yeah i think everyone's kind of looking at them at the moment and being like wow they can just do that you know um so yeah we'll see we'll see how it keeps going um yeah, it was it was really um, it was a huge bummer to see our government. Even though I expect that there's much from them, our new coalition government down here um, endorsed the strikes back at Yemen, which was just like so ridiculous. Because it's like, and now we're sending something like six NZ D- Defense Force staff over, and it's kind of this thing where it's like you're sending six guys not because you actually think that they'll make a difference just because it's like this token gesture sort of thing. And it's like, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a huge anti-war sentiment happening. Um, They're building up in New Zealand at the moment where it's kind of like, oh, you're just like dragging us into this with America and the UK. And now things with the ICJ going where it's like, it looks like, you know, uh, they're going to get done for, well, Israel is going to get done for genocide. It's like, okay, well, so our government in a token gesture sort of like oh we'll send a handful of people over to show support uh has kind of has made our nation complicit in that you know like we've had the interim ruling at the icj when that goes through like i i I feel like it's i'm pretty confident that israel are going to get charged you know with genocide um i think it'll feel like it's just formality stuff now but what does that mean? I mean, obviously, like, I don't think that's going to make Israel stop. But what does that mean for all these smaller nations like New Zealand that supported these things? And, you know, does that mean that, you know, Judith Collins and Winston Peters are like complicit in some way? How do we deal with that as a nation? You know, uh, so, yeah, I, um, I've been thinking about that a lot, particularly in the last couple of days. But carrying on um there's some other stuff going on uh in over in the states yeah this one's a a doozy (laughs) yeah texas governor greg abbott and immigration standoff with federal government the southern border of the united states has been a humanitarian crisis for more than a decade as central and south american refugees have been making their way north to seek asylum only to face internment camps family separation and deportation few places have been more cruel to these migrants than the state of texas which has been arresting thousands on trespassing charges routinely busing asylum seekers and immigrants to so-called liberal states and installing floating barriers in the rio grande last week the u.s supreme court voted five to four to allow federal agents to remove razor wire from a 30 mile stretch on the border near eagle pass which the federal government argued was impeding border patrol activity in response texas governor greg abbott released a truly wild statement claiming that the biden administration has failed to uphold its constitutional responsibility to protect each state from invasion and invoking a legal argument that a state's sovereign interest in protecting their borders would supersede federal immigration policy yeah like the invasion language is so wild like yeah so in essence abbott is claiming that the u.s constitution gives him the right to deploy the military in this case the texas national guard to secure the border with violence and defiance of the federal government so yeah so 
he's kind of using yeah i mean he's basically using the um the, the texas national guard as his own private military to go against the the will of the larger federal united states which is um yeah it's definitely uh a decision and also probably the will of the people of texas like you know famously texas is one of the most gerrymandered uh states i think in 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 the union and uh you know there are definitely lots of marginalized people uh lots of uh you know non-marginalized left-wing working class people uh in uh in texas you know it's uh it's just it's just such a joke it's it's absolutely just absurd this this kind of thing yeah 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 and it's um and like so i actually last time i was in the states and mexico was at the um when the whole um the migrant caravan thing was coming up and trump was doing his whole thing and it was um it was wild to be in mexico and see because um especially in places near the border uh there are a lot of places where there is a huge uh, American like expat community, you know, where it's these people that will retire in Mexico to take advantage of the economy, right? They take their savings, their pension or whatever. They take to Mexico where they can get more for that money. So economic migrants, right? And so to see them in Mexico being like, turn them back you know like to be like literally like protesting having like signs on their walls on the walls of their like the giant walled houses with barbed wire around it on the beachfront and like Tijuana and stuff and it's like this is wild like like you guys realize that you are you're the other side of that but you're like <laughs> more like you're an economic migrant but you're like the the, the shameful kind of like like you were doing this purely for like, um, you know, like the, a lot of these people are trying to get to America for life or death reasons. Whereas it's like, you're just doing it because you just want to, you know, have a, you just want to have more money when you put your feet up, you know, like you're doing it for like an early retirement, whatever like that. Like you should be ashamed. Like that's literally disgusting that you're doing that. And then, you know these people that have like children that they're carrying up across the border it's just yeah i can't like the the mindset of these people is just deranged. it's vile absolutely um, vile yeah yeah so um abbott's received a lot of support from his right-wing colleagues a week prior to the supreme court vote the gop led house of representatives set the stage by passing a resolution condemning what they call an open border policy by the biden administration Republican governors of 24 U.S. states have released a joint statement of solidarity with Texas, with several having already committed their own National Guard troops to assist in Texas border defense, and some suggesting more could be on the way. And, like, one thing that always just strikes me as deranged is that um, so many people that, like, people don't even know that, like, Texas used to be Mexico, right? Like, you think Texas, is that an English name? Like, it's like, right. you know, right. like, um, but so many of the people that do move up from South America are from ethnic groups that historically moved around those areas freely anyway. And I think it was up until the sixties, if you were like a, you know, like, um, like if you belong to, you know, certain ethnic groups or whatever, you could just freely pass up and down it was like a, there was like a special visa thing for them because it was like historically that's where a lot of you know people would just move around these areas um and then just to be like for texas to set up the stronghold is just so fucking very um i don't know it kind of reminds me of um like yeah the early days of of south africa kind of setting up um but yeah, anyway, yeah, despite the insistence of right-wing governors and legislators that the southern border represents an existential crisis to the nation, the right-wing of the GOP have stubbornly resisted attempts at immigration reform. After former GOP House leader Kevin McCarthy refused further funding to Ukraine without border security last year, a bipartisan group of senators began negotiations and appear to have reached an agreement. However, 
Current GOP leader Mike Johnson has indicated that any form of compromise bill from the Senate will be dead on arrival in the House. We're sure that has nothing at all to do with the border being an animating issue for the racist base of the Republican Party in, the, in an election year, though. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing, right? It's election year. Um, like, you know, and I mean, like, it's it's almost like clockwork, right? They got to pick something up, pick some kind of existential threat to the nation and just start, you know, they make it an issue. They make that the, the, the divider. Um, but yeah, what's happening over in, um, in Austria? So we got more stuff in central Europe surrounding, uh, the far right. And last week we reported on this, uh, the, 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 the German, uh, protests uh, against the far right, the far right party AFD alternative for Deutschland. Um, after it came to light, the elected members of the party met with neo Nazis to discuss a remigration plan to remove migrants, refugees, and people of quote unquote foreign origin, uh, which is basically just like anyone they don't like to, you know, black people and and backwards. Mm. It's it's literally like foreign origin like what what does that mean you know what i mean like you could say that everyone's from foreign origin with an abstract concept <laughs> yeah. such as you know a, a state existing in a border so it's just so absurd um so they want to move people of foreign origin and refugees and migrants uh, out of the country uh, but this week in austria thousands of protesters took to the streets organized around the same message uh, and demands in innsbruck salzburg and Vienna. German authorities are considering a ban on Austrian Martin Sellner, the leader of the Identitarian movement, who was also present at the AFD meetings and has been openly supportive of the plan for quote unquote remigration, which he hopes to popularize across Europe. Calls in both pro in both protests to defend democracy may seem wishful or naive to some, uh, but if governments did start to explicitly reject far right parties, it could safeguard against the broader formation of fortress europe i mean you know the, the the this is this is um it's a broader thing it's it's fortress europe you know we've spoken about this before the big world uh sorry the big wall that surrounds europe that prevents migrants from getting in um you know that's that's only really bolstered by far-right attitudes and and far-right uh reactionary uh, you know actions uh the 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 basically hurt any kind of racialized person any kind of migrant yeah, and if um, if that name Martin Selner sounds familiar to you, it's because he's like one of the recurring figures of the kind of I guess like the four chan generation of European neo Nazism. Um, yeah, so I mean, like he's had his fingers in everything over the years. Um, he's yeah, like all different kind of identitarian groups. Um, yeah, even like he was. He had communicated with and received a large uh, money don't uh, cash donation from Brenton Tarrant, who was the terrorist that did the Christchurch mosque shootings down here in New Zealand, um, and like all kinds of stuff over the years. Like he's yeah, he's one of those dudes that is like like he's probably like the European version of Richard Spencer or someone like that. You know, um, I think he'd be like mid thirties. He's kind of he does the whole song and dance about like, you know, trying to like dress well and being put together and trying to be really charming. But then is like underneath, under the thinnest little layer of like hair gel is just like, just the most rampant bigot that you can imagine. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, like Husker is mentioning in the chat, also married to a really well-known American white supremacist, one of the trad wife kind of, uh, of uh, influences so yeah um you know so even him just being around is is very bad news cool so what else we got here we got um oh france so uh yeah this kind of reminds me a lot it has shades of the indian uh farmers protests there have been like numerous kind of like farmer protests um in recent years some of them left wing some of them very reactionary in new zealand we had a very um reactionary farmer convoy movement that was basically um farmers get a really sweet deal in new zealand and they were 
they're they're responsible for a lot of our pollution and they barely pay any tax and all this kind of stuff like that and so our um our farmers well our farm owners i would say not our farm workers have a very different like class position to a lot of other farmers around the world like they do in india and um looks like in France but um yeah so over 55,000 farmers in France have become a, a massive protest across the country blocking major highways into Paris with tractors and hay bales dumping crates of produce and spraying manure on supermarkets and public buildings the farmers have been enraged by rising costs of diesel slow payment of subsidies from the EU and competition from importers flooding the market with cheap produce particularly affected are organic farmers whose greater cost of produce has not been met with increased prices from distributors despite rising consumer prices in stores newly installed prime minister gabriel attell has attempted to quell the protests promising to put agriculture above everything else by scrapping plans to increase fuel costs and appealing to the eu for policy changes these concessions seem to be insufficient for the farmers with alexandre plateau of the national federation of farmers union saying a few requests have been met but it is not enough it is expected that further protest actions will happen around this issue in future and the farmers have broad support with some polls showing as much as 90 percent of french people siding with them um yeah, isn't it interesting? So many of these giant protests that we've covered over the years on Red Planet, um, the price of like fuel and diesel always pops up. Um, yeah, you know, like obviously there's so like the petrochemical industry is like just linked to so many, I would say, intensely like structural problems with um with the world and you know linked into like neoliberalism and all that kind of stuff but um yeah i think it's really interesting that that's the thing that constantly comes up um it's yeah it's it's fuel it's our dependency on it it's um the problems that it it creates uh like the environmental problems the economic problems and everything like that um yeah it's uh it's it's the big one i would say um, yeah, it is, um, it is interesting to see this, um, over nine, well, they say as much as 90% of French people siding with them. Um, I would like to talk to some French, it would be interesting to see if we could get someone, um, on stream to talk about this because it is, it is a little bit hard sometimes because I did see some foreign, um, news sources talking about the New Zealand, um farmer convoys and kind of getting a little bit of it wrong um you know there was some kind of like mischaracterization um so i'm I've, i'm wary especially seeing what seeing that and then thinking about like you know like i i hope there's not some kind of reactionary element here that we are uh, um you know that we just don't get because i'm kind of you know out on the out of the loop on a lot of french politics but um considering the broad support from normal people the the gigantic number 55,000 farmers uh, in New Zealand our actual farm owners number is like quite low there's not that many farm owners um, a lot of farm workers though and it was those farm owners that were the ones doing the protest whereas like a lot of the farm workers were you know like uninvolved or you know didn't really have any skin in the game so um yeah, yeah. So the number 55,000 makes me think it's more to do with people that are, you know, like not quite the um, the the overlords that a lot of the farmers down here are. Yeah, from what we know from the Zard and from what we know um, from organizing in France is that like there tends to be a lot more class traitors in the ownership class like it, it, well i say ownership class it's like it's more like you know we're talking small businesses petty bourgeois um farmers kind of thing um and there are certainly like in paris itself like paris is like very central to france so it's arguable that if these are like if these if these are farmers around france then possibly they could come from places where there are historic farming families that aren't necessarily massive agricultural companies that are making a lot of money. But it is also arguable that like, you know, there are, there are, there are farmers who are like, you know, they're, they're in it for themselves. They're in it, they're in it for the, for the company that they're sort of like, you know, that they're, they're running at the moment. But yeah, I imagine, I imagine 
like there are a lot of situations like this where farmers are sort of like goaded into um support from the reactionary far right and they sometimes reject it i think uh, but of course it's like it's very easy for farmers to like get on board with that support because they don't get support from you know as many people as, as as they would like right and i'm not like making excuses here i'm not saying like oh we need to be nicer to people who are nice to nazis it's like that's not what i'm saying what i'm saying is that like people are going to take support where they can get it and if they're not getting it from the left then that's really on us that we need to like do better and and, and organize more in rural settings but again that's something that we've we've had as a a request on the show again and again and again you know people in rural areas asking us like how do we organize how do we do this and uh, yeah, yeah. it's definitely something uh, i may or may not have just sent a message to jay from um the zad uh asking them asking them if they actually know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyone that would yeah, be yeah. Uh, uh you know relevant for red planet well, yeah support. like what you said um there's so one of the big kind of um farmer convoy protest groups down here was one called groundswell nz and um they started off as a small group of um you know like farmers but they were like very quickly um kind of co-opted and massively fund by funded by a bunch of right-wing media orgs um these kind of like or and also just like yeah libertarian think tanks and things like that so it initially it became a thing where it was like oh you know they're like making us pay more taxes or whatever and then all of a sudden it's like you know like these kind of like vaguely racist um kind of statements about like there was a big um there was we were trying to push through like a water reform thing in new zealand called three waters um and there was an element of um like part of it was that the government was going to have to consult with um you know so it's like local councils but then also having to consult with um mana whenua in the area so the local um like the local sub tribes local hapu um and which generally kind of happens anyway but it was actually just going to be put into kind of legislation and that became this kind of like very racist like anti-maori kind of um campaign and so all of a sudden these farmers were like talking about how like oh you know they're gonna come and they're gonna like take your land and they're gonna give it back to you know like and just like just ridiculous shit like that and um that movement was like very, very swiftly kind of co-opted and just became like a very different thing, very reactionary and um, got tied up with a lot of other shit like anti-vax stuff and all this kind of thing. So um, yeah, so I'm always kind of skeptical of that kind of thing based on that experience. But um, yeah, but I mean, like I said, the farmers in France may have a completely different kind of um class position like you're saying like yeah like with um like the petite bourgeois kind of uh farm owner thing is um uh yeah i mean like that's 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 a very um it is a very common thing but there is also these people that are just farmers that have been farmers for generations uh owning small farms uh doing their own thing and um yeah and times are tough for them as well and uh yeah maybe we'll learn a little bit more about that as it develops um yeah okay cool well so that's uh all the little news stories for this week um before we get into the main meat of the show just remind everyone listening that if you if you want to support the show the best way to do it and the only way that we are really able to continue to do this and put it together is through support from our patreon uh so yeah if you um if you like everything that we do and you want to you want to help out you want to show support in some way want to help us kind of expand our capabilities or you know do all that kind of stuff then um yeah head over to patreon.com slash red underscore planet and um yeah become a member show us some support and uh yeah you get a bunch of stuff or it in exchange to different tiers we'll go over that a little bit later but um yeah patreon.com slash red underscore planet all right cool so with that out of the way um today we're gonna be here talking about operational and information security uh in for activists um 
This is something we've covered a couple times over the years. There's been a couple of episodes that we've focused on this kind of thing, but um, it's really kind of become apparent that it is, um, it's increasingly important these days with, like we were saying earlier, there has been kind of this, um, this, renewed push against environmental activists and i would say that is probably matched by a by a, a greater swell of anti kind of um anti-oil and anti i would say you know just like in general like climate activism and stuff um but also, uh, you know, then recently we've had a lot more actions for like, um, you know, in support of Palestine and support of Yemen and everything like that as well. And or oh, and um, anti-cop stuff like Cop City, all of that kind of stuff is um, police and I guess the state in general is kind of um, is in a lot of places around the world granting itself new powers new kind of things to deal with protesters and i think um you know there's there's a lot to be said about the way the state works with like various different i guess like organs of the state or like other things like the media to i guess like manufacture um, consent to do really terrible things to activists but um there's yeah there's um there's certain things you can do to protect yourself if you not that we you know we don't condone breaking the law or doing anything like that we can't say anything like that but in most countries around the world you have a right to protest you're legally allowed to actually to go out and do things which may even break the law in some ways if it is a protest and um you know obviously like it's it's our well it's my position that um it is it becomes an obligation to protest at a certain point right um if you if you're seeing what your government is doing if you're seeing what certain corporations are doing and um the damage that they are doing is you know, like immense, but you can, if you can do something about it, if you can stop that in some way, it's almost like, like you, you should feel compelled to do so, right? Like you should feel obligated to act. Like, um, I think the way things are, people can get a bit desensitized to things or they can think that maybe it's not like, you know, they think like, oh, Gaza's a long way away. There's nothing I can do. But um, I don't think that's true at all. And I think there are very, meaningful ways that people can support all kinds of causes all around the world, whether it's climate, whether it's um, imperialism or anti-imperialism, um, you know, like these things that we can do, but to do that, you need to stay safe. And um, there's, I would say the, the landscape is changing and especially in regards to information security and the way that uh, like, the internet and people's online digital footprint has kind of um has changed things now that like back in the day you just never had to worry about any of that kind of stuff you didn't have to worry about you know like um like going to a meeting with some friends and worried like you know is is someone recording with a phone is someone doing whatever you know like and uh, or it, yeah there's just so much stuff to go into like with devices and the internet and tracking and all of that kind of stuff so um yeah what i would say is uh i think it's really important that everyone becomes familiar with what is their local laws around protest and everything like that and like what they're what they're allowed to do because even even though protests of and activism obviously like runs afoul of the law in certain places it is still like very important to know exactly where those are going to be so you can prepare for it and so that you can also um you can anticipate it with the way that you practice uh your opsec and your infosec um a great example of kind of what you know or actually the thing that triggered 
um, us wanting to do this episode at this time is actually what happened just the other week with um, Palestine Action, uh, who we obviously had on the show last week as well. I wasn't here, but um, so we're going to go through a story from the Daily Express. So the Daily Express actually are directly involved in this story because Palestine Action had planned and they planned a protest at the London Stock Exchange, but their group had actually been infiltrated by a member, by a journalist from the Daily Express, who then alerted authorities, had the entire thing shut down. Six of them were arrested, but only one of them has been charged so far. But um, yeah, so we're going to go through the story from the Daily Express, from the yeah, the, the very normal newspaper that was responsible for this bust. And um, we're going to have a look at like kind of what happened here uh, and then kind of go through there. And then we're going to touch on some other things and all that kind of stuff. But we're going to start with this because it's topical. Um, and it's also very, in a very interesting way. Um, like the way that they've presented it is very interesting as well. So the Daily Express, here we go. We've got um, a pro-Palestine mob plotting UK economic chaos by shutting down London Stock Exchange. So we got that pro-Palestine mob plotting UK economic chaos. Like, wow. Like, you know, they're already, they've framed this. Like, this is um, like Guy Fawkes or V for Vendetta or something yeah, like that, yeah. right? Yeah, like, it, like, it's, like it's a wild mob. We've got like uh pitchforks torches ready to create chaos like you know absolute chaos at the stock exchange um and it's so funny because the word you know th this is all like this is this is hack journalism 101 right it, you know just conjure up all these images uh, of what it's going to look like why they're acting like that um you know <clears throat> economic chaos like UK economic chaos, like they're trying to make the working person go, oh my God, oh, what would, what would have happened if they'd have done this stuff? What kind of, what kind of repercussions would it have had for me? Would I have been able to pay my rent? Would I have been able to pay my bills? You know, it's just conjuring up these images of like evil, horrible people, like they're going to create chaos. They have no organization or anything like that. Yeah. Um, like yeah. even the way that they, the, the picture, the header picture of this is um, a couple of activists in jumpsuits with balaclavas on, pink balaclavas. And it says, um, a Palestine action activist wearing a balaclava at a protest at an Albert Systems factory. And it's like, okay, like it's a bunch of kind of, I guess, kind of scary looking people drudging across like a field or whatever, but they don't say like, oh, you know, what's, what's albert systems yeah what do they do what do they do <laughs> the war crimes factory you know like albert <laughs> systems are uh, a weapons manufacturer they they make you know the, they make components for the drones that go and kill children all throughout the world you know like in 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 gaza in yemen um you know like albert systems are a terrible terrible company that are responsible for so much death all over the world and um i find i think that's a little scarier than someone in a pink, pink balaclava it is but, um, it is and 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 also yeah. the you know what they're doing they're doing it they're doing a lot of stuff here i mean i think like you know they're aware the daily express are aware that they're publication is not going to reach the eyes of the average working class joe uh you know joe jordan or jane uh uh in 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 whatever neighborhood uh you know that, that is facing extreme horrible economic precarity I, I don't think they're under any illusion that that's going to happen you know they're they're writing to their audience and their audience is is majority working uh sorry middle class white families uh you know who've got like the the an income of maybe a hundred grand in between, you know, two, two wage earners kind of thing. I think I saw like a, a, a <laughs> I think I saw a, I think I saw an article recently, and I don't know if this was in the express, but it'd be really funny if it was about a guy who was worried because he only earns 60 grand a year, 
only earns 60 grand a year, I think I'll be lucky to see 60 grand in my entire life as, as, as if we're going on previous years. Uh, but like, you know, and he has to pay 20 grand a year for his son to go to a private school. It's like, okay. And, I, and I do, I, again, I don't know if this was the express, but like, those are the kind of people who are reading the express. Those are the kind of people who are reading this, but I don't even think that they have an accurate understanding of what the London stock exchange does and what it serves as a function like if the if the london stock exchange collapsed tomorrow it would do an immeasurable amount of good for so many people like oh my god if people who were like you know controlling like people's mortgage rates like that's what the stock exchange is about you know what i mean like you know that would be crazy how much how much good that would do so yeah yeah it's, they're, they're, um... yeah go ahead yeah well, I was just going to say it's um, all over the world. It's like this dependency on the stock exchange and like um, the kind of like the system surrounding it where it's like, you know, like people have just, people have this idea in their head that it's like, oh, if the stock goes down, the exchange goes down, we're all, we're all broke sort of thing. And it's like, okay, well, the line goes down but there's still just as much food in the world. There's still just as many jobs that need to be done. There's still all of these things, except, you know, just <laughs> the stock isn't there. I think that's like, that's, you know, like, I mean, like this whole kind of like, you know, like the Milton Friedman, like kind of economic shit like that. Like, I think that's like the thing, right? Like people have like, become attached to this idea that that is what underpins everything but it's like no like it's it's very it's largely untethered from the material reality um without kind of i guess like the like so much of our i guess like um like corporate and like state apparatus is is tied to it and if that was like untethered, you know, like I think a lot of people would see like, oh, actually it just doesn't actually matter. It doesn't like, we don't need any of this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, like um, Graeber wrote that incredible book. I think it was called bullshit jobs. Um, you know, and a lot, a lot of the jobs that he describes as bullshit jobs are finance jobs, uh, jobs in the financial sector, banks, you know, they're not necessary for the survival of the species. They're only necessary for people to, uh, you know, controllers. And again, like, you know, the stock exchange is, is essentially, it's, it's like a day at the dog track for extremely wealthy people, right? It's like, let's, let's take a gamble. Oh, it looks like Apple's going up, right? Okay. What do you want? 500 on Apple? Okay. Done. Like, what do you want? 600 on Google? Meta? Okay, great. Uh, you know, that's, that's kind of how it goes down. Like you said, like, you know, the economy is an immaterial thing. Uh, it's literally not related to how, uh, you know, people will survive and, and live their lives outside of this, you know, <clears throat> and also like you got that too, where you said it before you said it that like, you know, neoliberalism is, is the thing that makes people think that the stock exchange is, exp is, is important because mm. that's where the free market is, right? The free market is the stock <laughs> that's exchange. Where it lives. Yeah. That's where the invisible hand lives. It lives in the stock exchange. <laughs> <laughs> Literally the guy, the guiding hand of, uh, of, of the, the market is in the, in the stock exchange. So yeah, it's, uh, they're, they're, they're positing, they're positing all these things that could be possible from a day of action from, uh, this, this woke lefty pro Palestine mob. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so that's, that's the thing. It's, let's get back into the story because it's, it's so interesting to read this from the perspective of the publication that was directly involved in this, because it also gives you an idea of like, what was their intention for sending a journalist to infiltrate this group? Right. So here we go. Pro Palestine fanatics are planning a week <laughs> of chaos on the streets of Britain this like a week of chaos from these fanatics and it's like like it's a fan, you're a fanatic if you if you want to prevent genocide that's fanatic behavior um 
and so on the streets of Britain, you know, that makes it seem like the stock exchange goes down and just like riots erupt in the street. Like all of the guys in the stock exchange with all their ties just just start freaking out. And they just, you know, it's like, no, like, yeah, chaos on the streets. Anyway, yeah, it's like, you know, like the Dark Knight Bane. Kind of Literally, situation. that's what that's what they're conjuring the image of. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um activists from Palestine Action intend to lock themselves together at the front entrance to the building, stopping anyone from getting inside and the hope it will cause huge economic damage. Following a two-month investigation where an express reporter posed as a potential new member of the group, we were told exactly how the activists intend to stage one of their most disruptive protests yet on Monday morning. The plan is for two activists, armed with fire extinguishers filled with red paint, to climb on top of two revolving doors close to each other at the main entrance, place a ladder over both their heads, and then chain their necks to it with bike locks. So basically just um, spray a bunch of red paint everywhere and lock themselves into the door um, so that it, you know, it obviously prevents the entire doors from being open for people getting in and out. Um, yeah, this is actually similar to um there's been a bunch of our um our conservative politicians that are part of this new coalition government down in new zealand whose offices have been sprayed with red paint over the last couple of weeks especially after they decided to send troops to go to you know to yemen and stuff um and the way that the newspapers have been talking about and framing these like you know this vandalism this, this red paint is using the language of terrorism you know, and it's like this very, like, it's a very deliberate framing that they're like, this is, you know, this act, this is a victimless act of vandalism, of political vandalism, is terrorism, you know? So um, that's a lot of what is going on here, right? Like, yeah, they're using that fanatics word. Yeah, 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 fanatics, week of chaos on the streets. Um, yeah, huge economic damage. So, um yeah, well, yeah. Fanatics, so that... fanatics is is uh, genuinely, I think, used here intentionally to conjure the image of like a terrorist, right? Because a terrorist seen as a religious fanatic, a religious zealot that's that's doing terrorism, I guess, in the name of, of Islam, right? That's that's the yeah. the image that they want people to 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 see. Yeah, yeah. So um, the other activists will lock themselves together in front of the main and back entrances while fake banknotes painted red to represent blood are symbolically fired from money guns. So this is a very like, you know, this is like blockbuster protest moment, like, whoa, you know. <laughs> um, so during a secret meeting involving five activists, their ringleader and our undercover reporter, the ringleader suggested that those sitting in front of the doors could also use bike locks to secure their necks to the handles of the revolving doors. The ringleader quipped darkly that by locking their necks to the glass entrance, the stock exchange's traders, who he branded Lords of War, would be unable to enter the building without fatally injuring the protesters. He said, they can't move the door without like fucking killing you. <laughs> the group hoped that the tactic of locking themselves to the ladder will be something police won't have seen before, prolonging how long they can keep staff out of the building. Even, with the, even though the stock exchange itself operates electronically, the activists believe the demonstration could ca cause turmoil. We just need to shut it down for the whole working day, the organizer told our undercover reporter. We want to shut them down. We're thinking we want to try and get two comrades to get up on both the doors, to stand up there, take fire extinguishers up with them. Then once they're in position, they can do all the spraying and that with the fire extinguishers. So the thing is, it is operates electronically and there's actually not that many people that go in and out. So I think like it definitely would deal a blow to them but the idea that this would like result in like weeks of chaos or anything like that is like you know i think it's like a bit like they are definitely like making out like you know this is way more of like an act of terrorism than it's more like i would say it's more of a symbolic kind of um symbolic protest well this well this is this is what i wanted to jump in and say like there so two things like you say 
they're somehow saying it's going to be it this is lit it's literally fascism 101 right like our our enemy is simultaneously weak and, and ridiculously strong so you know oh, it's going to cause weeks of chaos and oh my god these fanatics they're going to do all this and, and they were apprehended but then they're like oh no actually it wouldn't have done that much damage because the stock exchange is is controlled electronically and it's like yeah yeah which which one is it bro like you know do you do you want a hand deciding how much damage this would have done um and on top of that, you, you've also got like this um, this this idea that it that it's like okay, so no one could get in and out, and but nothing will change because it's it's controlled electronically. But like there are staff that need to get in there to do their jobs, mm -hmm. and there are like you know security and cleaners and all this kind of stuff. Like it's a building that needs to be maintained in some fashion, like okay people aren't going in there like they did in the 80s with their briefcases and their big phones and phoning their friends and being like oh this is how you know do this that and the other but you know it's not like nobody goes in there it's not like it's a fully autonomous work from home kind of thing like you know that they're, they're saying that there would be no uh, uh, uh disruption possible um, but you know, what you said is, is also valid. Like it, it doesn't matter if there was no disruption whatsoever, because it would be symbolic. It would be like this, this is where the money is, is sort of like enabling this, this genocide. This, this is the economic center of our country. And this is what needs to be attacked in order to, to do anything about it. it, it you know, it would be highlighting a lot of, a lot of stuff going on here. I do also want to point out like, you know, the the Express think, think that they're being really funny here by detailing all the different plans of the action. But actually what they're doing is they're informing other activists in ways in which they could do stuff. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, they, um, <laughs> they are kind of, I mean, they, they're doing it for dramatic effect, right? But um, yeah, they go into this a little bit more. Here, yeah, so they say, um, our reporter was told the other activists would place their arms inside metal tubes before locking themselves together and blocking the doors at both the front and rear of the building. This, he, uh, he was told, will slow the police down as they will be wary of hastily removing them in case the protesters have something like broken glass or barbed wire inside the tubes. Describing the damage they are hoping the protest will cause, the organizer said, it's the great chance that you can literally just shut down the London Stock Exchange. Obviously, people can trade on their phones nowadays, but there's going to be a lot of computers in there that people aren't going to have access to. They could hold hundreds of millions of pounds worth of shares. Palestine Action proudly bragged that they used direct action to shut down and disrupt multinational arms dealers who supply Israel with weapons. This week of action is designed to cause chaos for British companies doing business with the Israeli Defense Force. Action is also planned in Manchester, although our reporter was only given specific details of the protest planned at the London Stock Exchange's Paternoster Square headquarters. During a series of video calls, our reporter was also told how to make the most of his time in a police cell once arrested for his part in the protest. So um, this is an interesting thing where they did, um, they have, I guess, operated in cells to an extent where it's like, so they, we're only discussing this action there is something else going on but that's we're not going to talk which is which is good um there is probably you know like um ideally they would have done more of that which maybe we'll talk about in the future which perhaps would have stopped this journalist from getting access but we don't actually know you know like like they say this journalist was posing as someone that was wanting to get involved with the action um so I think in, in a lot of groups, especially when you're doing things that I guess would um, be more kind of skirting the, skirting the bounds of legality, there's generally, um, you have to be very, you have to vet everyone pretty extensively and, um, and keep everyone only knowing the things that they need to know sort of thing. So um yeah, we don't know what, what this journalist had to go through to get access to this or whatever. So we can't really comment on that. But um, it seems like over a period of months, they kind of, um, you know, like got in with this group or whatever, which I think is like, there's so many people since October that are now kind of getting into 
this kind of protest, especially around Palestine and stuff, it would be very hard to be like, is this person someone that has recently become radicalized or is this, you know, can we trust them? Whatever. So, um, yeah, I yeah. think this is, I, I have like a, a bit of stuff to say about this and this isn't necessarily me criticizing Palestine action because I think, oh, yeah, no, no, of course, I think, I like, think they're great. Like, um, you know, like obviously like critical support for Palestine action, but we have to, any political project, any activist group or whatever like that, we always have to be looking at what happened and what, um, you know, yeah, like realistically looking at it and be like, how, how did this person infiltrate this group? What was the part that went wrong? Like where, you know, and then, you know, through that you evolve and kind of, um, you know, learn for the future and things like that. Well, this is, I think this is why, like, uh, you know, we need to remember, like, the copying of ideas um, is literally, and, like, you know, helping other organizations by, like, sharing your ideas. Uh, again, it's why we at Red Planet say, please copy our show. We don't care mm. about IP. We don't care about you, like, stealing our format or whatever. It's It's literally, like... You know, I, I could go. At, I could talk at length about IP and what I think of it, but it, that's that's whatever. That's by the by. Um, I think what I'm trying to say here is that, like, f I can see from an organizing perspective how sudden growth can lead to issues, and so, so sudden growth is really good for an org. If you get like a lot of people joining, if you get a lot of people wanting to get involved, it's obviously like absolutely incredible, and you need to like find out the best way that you can galvanize your organization's actions and the work that you do with that sudden influx of members. Um, but I could give you an example, like, you know, in the tenants union, we had an issue whereby last year we started to grow quite exponentially in a, in a small period of time, we suddenly got a lot of interest and that resulted in like a couple of new branches being sort of established and the problem with those new branches one of them turned out really really good and really really solid and that's because we had um a lot of support in that area a lot of members with a lot of free time um and another one kind of faltered and, and didn't really get established as proper as properly because there were so many new members and they weren't really the problem was is that we didn't tell them exactly like what our aims are with the org there was a lot of mobilization but not organization was the problem essentially and i think that that's what happens yeah i think that that's what happened that it has happened with um uh palestine action in this one particular case um and again you know an organization is an organization and you need to have specific members doing specific things in that organization otherwise it's not organized and a vetting of members a complete vetting of all members is a very difficult hard yeah absolutely job. yeah especially if you're a volunteer like you're going to be going in and you're like what you're looking at everybody on linkedin you're looking at everybody's phone numbers you know so you're going to have to be compliant with data protection as well as an organization um there's all these different things that you have to do so you know you you are going to struggle with that massive influx of growth. And I, I, I think personally, I think that Palestine action did pretty good. Yeah. Uh, in order to like prevent any other actions from getting sabotaged as a result of this infiltration. I think that like, th this is just a natural thing that's going to happen, organize it happen in organizations that have this, like, uh, you know, it's not out of nowhere. It, it's out of the actual, things that are going on in in the world geopolitically and, and people being made aware of it and of course as a result of that you know they've they've uh, they've experienced this huge growth and i think that this is just something that's going to happen as a result of that you know yeah yeah and it's uh, this is this kind of thing has happened so many times over the years um new zealand in particular has a history of police infiltration and protest groups um yeah like undercover like literally like undercover police agents posing as activists for like up to years at a time but forming relationships with people like literally like um yeah there's been a couple that have been busted for going so deep cover that they're like you know like literally like have girlfriends in the orgs that they're like sleeping with and things like that like really like gross kind of stuff like you know um and be become like significant figures in the movement and then only 
for them just to disappear one day and then you know later on find out like oh yeah this guy was a police informant the entire time you know um sometimes they are yeah sometimes they're police agents sometimes they are compromised activists you know like sometimes you get an activist that is facing a big charge and they go okay shit all right you know like um and that's happened a lot of times over the years um even with like bigger like yeah more historical groups like um like the red brigades in italy um a lot of it was people being arrested and being like you're basically going to jail for the rest of your life or even facing like execution things like that unless you roll over and you tell us as much as you know and then you know and so an organization can become a creep and the the bigger the actions get the more potential there is to be compromised and there's more at stake um so yeah so um back to the story the ringleader who called himself diamat so this is actually a good thing that they were referring to each other with you know with different names they're not like you know not john smith from you know from nottingham or whatever like that um which is you know that's that's good for opsec reasons but also you know like how do you know who these people are if you don't really know anything about them um so yeah there is there is a balance here between organizing and doing actions with people that you do actually really know but then just in these online spaces whether it's like it looks like they were doing things over zoom and things like that communicating through even encrypted apps like signal and things like that that have end-to-end -end encryption not using any real identifying information or anything like that even not referring specifically to like what you're going to do all that kind of stuff um can be really important so um yeah so this the ringleader diamat told the reporter via the encrypted app signal that the capitalist system and the financial sectors just fucking integral to connecting all the different colonial fucking projects and empires which have stolen fucking money from the people so he added monday's action is the start of a week of action against different institutions in britain that are compl complicit or facilitating israeli apartheid against the, the palestinians this day is targeting the financial sector so there's obviously no better target than the london stock exchange so this is probably referring to how they knew that there were other actions but they didn't actually know what they were about it was planned to be this i guess this is like the week of chaos or whatever like that like this is like they had planned different things throughout the week which i think is good like um to keep up the pressure kind of thing so they had decided this day was going to be we're going to attack the financial industry and then you know maybe next day it's going to be like you know like the the petrol industry or something like that you know just like different things um but i don't think any of that other stuff went ahead probably after these um these arrests so um so it's hard to say exactly you know if any of that like to what extent that was planned even if it was you know the group are hopeful their plot will encourage people to divest and sell their shares if they do have them in albert so yeah so that's the thing albert systems again the the war crimes factory they're wanting people specifically to divest from albert albert systems is an arms company that is the chief supplier of the idf and has been targeted on numerous occasions by palestine action so that's like yeah it's like chief supplier of the idf but you know it's like they don't really go into anything here they spend a lot of time demonizing and like even like using that kind of like like that kind of scary language around the protesters but then when it gets to you know the idf and albert system they're just you know completely passive <laughs> like it's just you know it's it, they're, so. they're doing a, a real good job of just like not even saying what albert is or like what what they're doing you know yeah. chief supplier you know but yeah, so optimistic about the economic impact the action could have, Diamat, who in a later meeting referred to himself as Shibby, said it could cause a load of destruction, obviously not just with Albert Systems, who trade, but with other companies, and they could take it out on Albert. And if they have shares in Albert, they could sell them out of spite. So Albert's got a good chance of losing a lot of stocks and shares. So um, 
yeah, potential slip, a uh, slip there where Diamet also called himself a shibby, um, which is like an easy thing to, you know, let slip a name or something like that. So that's something that is very, um, to be very careful with. Um, Albert Systems have, <clears throat> we've covered the numerous actions, Palestine action have um, taken against them over the years, which have been super successful, shutting down their factories, getting them to move out of neighborhoods, you know, all that kind of stuff. It is, it's that thing, right? When you hit the bottom line and they, you know, like that forces them to change. So if you can like tank their stock price in particular, like that could, you know, that could actually have a significant effect on the bottom line of the company so even though like you can't like this this um you know this action wasn't a physical attack on anything it's like that kind of um the attack on their i guess their 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 value you know their publicly traded value or whatever is um is just as effective as you know shutting down a factory which things like that also affect the stock price and you know so and if the stocks are going down people are going to look at it and be like oh man i need to sell this because i'm going to lose money and then you know so once you get the ball rolling on that it's it can be a kind of um can be a, a huge hit like i mean for example we all saw what happened with twitter when um you know elon musk took over and as soon as things started going bad it just goes from bad to worse. Like it's very hard to, to pull out of that kind of slump. But um, yeah. So even the speaking with a Liverpudlian accent, the self-proclaimed Marxist revolutionary said with their money guns, they would make it rain with blood soaked fake banknotes. Diamant added, there's going to be like a big Palestine flag banners like on the London, London stock exchange and the coat of arms around the front of the building will be soaked red. So yeah, even like the stuff like <clears throat> they're pointing out he's like he's probably from Liverpool, you know. Um, and even like that is self- a huge, a huge sort of like call back to Daily Express readers saying like, oh, Liverpudlians, you know, the ones who made all that fuss about Hillsborough, they speak in that funny accent, they're all poor, they all steal everything. Do you know what I mean? Like, lit- it's literally that. You're absolutely spot on. Like, mm. yeah, <clears throat> but um. Yeah, so explaining how two of the activists will stage their lock on, he said, they're going to put a ladder over their head either side because they're sort of close to each other, like the ladder's long enough and the doors aren't far away enough, where they can both sit on the doors and have this ladder over their heads and then lock on with a bike lock with their necks to the ladder. The Met Police's protest removal team have never seen anything like this before. I don't know how they're going to plan to remove them because if they try and move one, they'll move another. So they might not even touch them. So that's the thing, right? Like connected with this ladder and locked to it. If they try and do something to one, it's going to push on the other. It's going to make it really hard to do without being able to, you know, unlock them. So um, there could be security. What's one security guard going to do with like seven actionists fucking getting up the ladder? In a meeting on Thursday, January 11th, Diamat and all six activists, including our reporter, met online to discuss how the plan would work and what they'd need to pull it off. Diamat revealed that at 5 a.m. the next day, a member of Palestine Action would survey the site and assess the level of activity. He said, so we're going to get somebody there at 5 a.m. to check, check exactly who is going in, how frequently, what are they dressed like? And they're going to hang around until the regular trading hours. So they'll know if the doors are locked, whether they get unlocked at a certain hour. They'll know whether there's people coming and going regularly. So um, this is interesting as well. They've chosen to do it on the day um, to see when um, they get locked. I don't know. I'm not sure. Actually, this is like worded quite weird. Um it doesn't, you know, I'm not sure if they've kind of staked it out in advance or if they're doing this kind of intel on the on the fly. Um, so some activists expressed concerns about needing to go to the toilet during the protest if it was successful and lasting all day. In response, Diamat advised the group, don't drink fluids in the morning, <laughs> which is like, yeah, that's like, that is a thing, you know, like I know people that have done protests from like, climbing up trees and just camping out there 
and um you know they've done stuff like um like you can get these like little like camping things that you kind of pee into and all this kind of stuff and it's just like it's an unfortunate thing that you just you have to figure out what's going on i know some that have even taken um there's like a medication that you can get for diarrhea that just completely just stops you for like a day or two or whatever and people have taken that and just been like there we go so um yeah he also suggested that any concerned activists don nappies so that they could relieve themselves on the spot during the protest i I, gotta i gotta i gotta ask here this is wild from the express I don't know why they put nappies in quotation in marks. I know, there. that's what I was thinking. It was like, quite weird, nappies. You, you don't um, say diaper in New Zealand, do you? No, we say nappies in New Zealand. Right, yeah, because yeah, you got like the Brit- the British colony brain down there. Yeah, like, like nappies is such a normal, common word. Like, I don't understand like why they put that quotation marks. Yeah. so weird. I mean, like, yeah, it's it, like... I guess he could like, yeah, it's possible that he could even be just saying it. It's like, well, we're nappies, you know, like whatever. But um uh but um yeah, no, it's like I mean, yeah, it's 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 a thing. I actually have heard of people doing that before. Um, but I don't think, yeah, it's not something that I've ever heard of anyone particularly having a problem with. Like I don't think no one I know has ended up like kind of you know shit in their pants or anything like that but i'm sure a lot of conservative protesters have though you know let's be real um members of the idf too apparently <laughs> but um when probed on what the other targets were for the week diamond said i could tell you if you were on the actions but it's just need to know my comrade so yeah so that's that's good um yeah i feel like this 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 journalist must have been kind of presumed to be taking part in the action they must have been kind of um yeah they must they must have been one of the people that was going to lock themselves on there because otherwise i don't think that they would have gotten this information at all yeah i mean the thing is is that like they don't discriminate and it's like drew was telling us last week there are so many different kinds of people who take part in palestine action actions um and support them just in general that it's like it's it it, i mean it's stupid to discriminate on people joining your org anyway like oh what you look like a tory you know like you know how are you gonna how are you gonna figure figure that one out like it's a bit of a like i have said it to be, before i've said it i've said it on the show i've said it when the the tory party conference is in town in in manchester here in the uk like uh, yeah you can smell them you can you can smell them for sure but you know that's just a bit it's a it's a bit rhetoric it's a bit of rhetoric really uh, and I, conjecture. Uh, um, I mean i know people that have kind of like vetted people before by um you know like if they've got something planned coming up and this person's like i want to get involved with that being like well hold on um you know we'll you don't need to know about that we're going to do something um you know like you can support the group in other ways um you know like we'll see you on the we'll see you on the picket lines we'll see you at the protests or whatever like that but you know like you kind of you know this like process of like we have to we have to see you around for a bit before. Cause I mean, like this guy, I think in infiltrated the group within a couple of months, um, most journalists wouldn't have the, um, wouldn't have, I guess the, um, the time or attention to really kind of stick it out for like maybe a year or so or something like that. And even with police informants, they're generally pushing them for results a lot more than that. So, um, yeah, I think it's just being really careful and being like, hey, look, um, you know, like, look, we understand you're really excited. You want to get involved. You can do that by, um, you know, when we have meetings, you can bring the sandwiches. <laughs> or, you know, no, that's, I mean, that's like a little infantilizing, but, you know, like to be like, you can get involved in other ways, but, um, you know, like not quite yet. You're not going to do anything that is too risky just yet. Um, I also I think, think you know, yeah, I also think that like, it's very weird the whole motivation behind this it's just so odd because it's like okay you said i'm gonna do this big action i get it that it that it's topical i get it that it's topical that makes sense in, in terms of like a news story like all right you're gonna do this thing uh but now everybody every fucking organization in the uk knows your face right 
everyone in the UK, every organization in the UK is now going to be on heightened alert of infiltration in their orgs. Yeah, he posted um, about it on Twitter and it was like, you know, on his own account with his, you know, everything like that kind of bragging about what he had done. And yeah, just all the comments were just like grass snitch. Like, you know. <laughs> in it, it's like everybody is so clearly aware um that it's like i don't understand what he thought he was gonna get like if if he thought he's gonna rebrand himself as like an infiltration journalist it's like oh the infiltration journalist is gonna be uh you know gonna be going to uh, uh, uh the this next organization next or whatever but like you can't you can't do that because yeah yeah yeah. like you're not like ross kemp you're not just gonna no. be able to go around the world and do all this other kind of stuff or whatever like that people are gonna be like right. all right cool this guy's done his one thing now he's just gonna you know he'll just go write the gossip column or something like that. literally literally yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah um do you want to read through um this next little bit um have you got it up there about the um going the stuff in the cells uh yeah i've definitely got this article right up here wasn't relying on you <laughs> to read all of it at all uh, advising our reporter on what to expect after being detained at a police station diamat said you can have as much food as you like he added when you're in the police station i recommend hot chocolate if they come to your cell to check on you frequently ask them for a hot chocolate before they leave at a fucking full english or something they do vegan food so make the most out of it it's good to sit there smug just getting fed and having hot chocolates brought to you which are dead tasty but it's also good because it does genuinely help pass the time although traders are now able to operate remotely branson knowles a former banker with chase bank told the express the protest could still prove extremely costly he said while remote trading has grown significantly in recent years the physical infrastructure of exchanges still plays a vital role in ensuring orderly markets so that first part on uh <laughs> that first part on uh and what to do when you're in a police cell uh yeah today's a learning day for me today i learned i didn't know that you could just like ask for like whatever whatever you want and however much food you like um i guess that's a result of people protesting uh for for detainants rights uh or detainees rights sorry uh under like you know human rights protesting and stuff like that and I think that's really based, actually, you know, if you've been at an action for, I don't know, how long you're going to be there before you get put in a cell, you're going to be there like what, you know, eight hours at least in some situations. Um, yeah, you're going to you're going to want to get a full English. Definitely. <laughs> you're going to want to get a, a big scran, massive scrans. Um, Jesus Christ. It's actually like really enticing considering like how poor i am at the minute and how much i want food but uh yeah i'm determined to not get arrested for for just for a scran um but yeah no that's that is that is a really like base thing what they're what they're doing here and in including this in the article and this is from from a, an analysis that i've had of years and years and years of looking at like the way that things are reported i'm sure tim is going to agree but like they're trying to make out that like oh when you get put in prison when you get put in a police cell or like something prison adjacent it's a holiday camp you got playstation 2s you got full englishes you got hot chocolates out the ass it's all related to that kind of like oh prison prison's just like a holiday camp kind of thing you know that's 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 what they're that's what they're telling their readers here that like uh, you know, Palestine action, they're looking forward to breaking the law. They're looking forward to getting arrested because it means they get loads of free full English, full Englishes. You know, I'm just, you know, the, the, the comment section on this article, if they have comments or whatever, is just going to be so many gammons just going on about like, I bet those poor scousers can't wait to get arrested so they get loads of free food. You know, that's literally what they're going to be saying, those kinds of things in the comment. Um but that but that next bit that i went into is is also really like telling as well um you know it, it, the fact that the the one of these um bankers a former banker not even actually like, like a banker who's in work now a former banker branson knowles is like yeah remote trading has grown pretty significantly but uh you know the physical infrastructure is still a, it plays a vital role uh you know we need to make sure that the uh, the markets are orderly so it's like again it's that flip-flopping in between uh you know uh, uh, uh 
whether this was going to be like a very costly action or whether it was just going to be like nothing. And it's like, well, no, it, it sounds like it would have had a, a massive effect. I feel like there's something to be said about the, um, the kind of, I guess, like the ideological effect of, you know, like attacking the stock exchange more than like what might, cause you know, they can obviously just continue trading with their phones doing whatever like that, you know, but like the, you know, like how stock prices are such fickle kind of things. And like the idea that like, Oh no, this someone they could attack it. They could do something to it. They could destabilize it. And then people start freaking out and selling all the shares and all that kind of stuff. I feel like that's where the real damage is, you know? So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I think is why they are so skittish about it and probably why they acted on this to, um, pre like yeah preventatively arrest them you know so, yeah, yeah it's it's one of those like you know you, you you're talking about disrupting again it's like a dog track it's it's like somewhere where rich people go to bet like if you're gonna um i you know and i do i do just want to reinforce that like if you if you if you're surprised constantly at the joke and the sham that capitalism is especially like you know neoliberal free market capitalism like yeah that this is this is that is what that is the stock exchange is just a place where rich people go i think that this company is going to do well today so let's uh, buy 500 shares it's uh, you know with a view to hopefully making some money so you know if if you attack uh something that people who are skittish about where they invest and, you know, assess a lot of risk and do that kind of stuff. Like, of course, it's going to have an effect on whether those people choose to invest that day or other people pull their shares. You're absolutely right, Tim. Like, and I that, think, that's... like, focusing on Albert as well really kind of, like, kind of shows how that works because they're like, you know, people will be like, oh, shit, I've got stocks in Albert. Um, they've, you know, they've had to shut down some factories. They'd have to move them out. Oh, those protesters were talking about them. That's bad for stock. That's going to go down. Like I need to sell now. You know, like that's the kind of shit, like that's the real kind of, I think, battlefield for this kind of, this kind of action, you know? So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Defo, so, shall I continue with the, yeah, yeah, it's my on. turn. You've done a lot of reading labor this episode, Tim. It's <laughs> yeah. my turn take my share in the labor uh okay so uh, going on from that um that bit about the orderly markets uh this guy branson knowles he said in the case of the london stock exchange shutting down the building when it's supposed to be open would absolutely cause disruption and financial losses so uh, yeah we're, we're getting more admissions here um as one of the largest equity markets in the world the london stock exchange facilitates trillions of dollars in trading activity each year um yeah, you know, sucks that they're using dollars in in our country. It's it's again like you know another example of uh, the imperial core hegemony being all based around the U.S. But anyway, let's continue. Even the briefest outage or delay in trading times could shock stock market participants and undermine confidence. It would also impair the ability of market makers and liquidity providers to execute their responsibilities, responsibilities that keep markets running smoothly on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think that's so funny. Generally, just as like just as like a concept, like we gotta keep that market running smoothly, otherwise things will go tits up. It's like, okay, so what you're telling me, what you're telling me by that admission is that um, this is a vastly um, uh, unstable thing. You're 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 telling me that actually, like this is completely uh, uh, at any point it could collapse, and um, it's it's totally precarious. Uh, it's just so funny, like, you know, market makers and liquidity providers. Like, I think, a, a liqui yeah, market maker is, is an absurd term. Uh, and like liquidity provider, to me, that says, because when a, when a company goes into liquidation, that means that like, I think something to do with the stocks, like the stocks all dissolve and go. Well, so, yeah, they're trying to like, when you liquidate a company, they're trying to like, just get rid of, everything that is like say they're trying to make everything into liquid money liquid funds you know so every they're just trying to sell off as much as they can just like everything and just kind of like make as much as they can out of it and completely liquidate the business in the process so um yeah you know that's why they're selling everything from the office they're trying to sell off all the stocks all that kind of shit like that yeah yeah so it's like you know basically what you're saying is these like 
vile parasites, these horrific people who like, you know, they've got blood, they've basically got blood on their hands as it is. Like they need to, they need to be uh, greasing the wheels of, of capitalism uh, in order to, in order to keep things going. It's, it's so ridiculous. Uh, but again, it's, it's that, it's that admission. It's that admission of, oh no, this, this would have been really bad if they'd have done this. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think we're, you know we that was one of the first things we mentioned at the, right at the start of the show was that like you know it doesn't take a huge group of people to do something like this and to kind of you know like to actually make an impact in that way so you know i mean imagine what you could do with a lot of people <laughs> you know? so yeah so um yeah we it is should be huh? we should be thinking about this we should be thinking about how much more we could do with more people um so continuing on from what this uh branson knowles is saying uh using rough estimate estimates even short-term disruptions could easily translate to millions if not billions of dollars in terms of lost trading opportunities and costs to unwind problematic positions reputational damage would also be hard to quantify uh victor bastard it just it just sounds like disrupting the stock exchange for a day would have been amazing uh, Victor Bass, the CEO of investment bank DAI Magister, agreed that a successful protest would could have major repercussions, even if it doesn't stop trading. He said an incident that caused the closure of the physical site of the London Stock Exchange wouldn't necessarily cause a disruption to trading itself. The vast majority of trading is now done remotely, so as long as online access to the London Stock Exchange remains, investors will not lose out on valuable trading time. However, in terms of fluctuations in the value of share prices, there would almost certainly be financial repercussions. Any significant or unexpected incidents, especially ones so closely related to the health of global markets, generally send a shockwave through the wider financial ecosystem as investors withdraw or withhold funds until the situation yeah, resolves yeah. itself. Yeah. So that's the thing, right? Withdraw or withhold funds. So it's kind of like you know, like to withdraw to like sell your stocks to get the money back and out of the system or withhold funds. So it's like to stop investing. So it's like they're kind of relying on your money being in there and you continuing to put to invest more, you know? So it's like, it's interesting um, that those are the things that, you know, threaten them the most. But um, yeah, you know, it's like that thing, like if everyone just decided to start withdrawing their stocks, it would be, um, yeah, like just, huge and obviously it's like to coordinate that across all lines would be like that would be really kind of chaotic but to don't go just for albert like let's just do it just for albert we're gonna do them that's very achievable you know yeah 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 absolutely um i'm just gonna finish uh what these loser e economy mm -hmm. brain people are saying um so um it was uh oh hang on where am i up to here victor basta yeah so victor basta ceo oh no i already read i already read from that guy resolves itself so as a result significant financial losses could well occur extending beyond the uk to international markets ultimately decision the decision would fall on the london stock exchange to determine whether a suspension of trading was necessary if access to the physical building was restricted if it was deemed that everyone still had equal access to the exchange and trading remained a level playing field that's a fucking joke um, there's certainly the potential for trading to continue unimpeded. On the other hand, the London Stock Exchange Group could haul, could call for a halt until the situation was resolved, a building access reinstated, which would put trading at a standstill. It's difficult to determine precisely how much money would be lost if trading was halted, as the amount traded varies drastically from day to day. The market cap of the company's trading on the London Stock Exchange currently stands at over three trillion dollars so theoretically this is all value that would suddenly become inaccessible if trading stopped the secondary impact of the closure of the london stock exchange could also end up costing millions or even billions values could be severely impacted due to the shock with traders and listed companies bearing the brunt of this mr Basta added that keeping the exchange up <clears throat> and running could be performed remotely even without access to the building but he said the issue would lie if the security of the london stock exchange were compromised in any way trading would be immediately halted if there was even a slight risk that any malicious party could tamper with market values so i find that um 
very funny for for like mm-hmm. many many reasons it is interesting that they're just like oh but we could just pause it you know like there's been <laughs> times before when things have happened and they've gone like wait no no we'll just pause it or we'll just reset it to yesterday and it's kind of just like what <laughs> like you can just do that <laughs> like, yeah you know it's um it's it's also really funny the way the economy brain people think about this kind of stuff that one bit where he was saying that like (laughs) if if it was deemed that everyone still had equal access to the exchange and trading remained a level playing field like that's oh yeah level playing field that's the lie of neoliberalism in a nutshell right like everyone's got access to the markets everyone's got access all you have to do is trade you just have to get involved it's a level playing field like sure up dude like there is a such a a a massive difference between john john fucko who owns like a a a mom and mom and dad bakery whatever mom and pop uh, bakery down the road and like jeff bezos right you know like jeff bezos who can actually afford to pay someone to do all of his financial investing for him like what are you talking about it's so it's it's it is it's just brain poison isn't it like like ridiculous absolutely ridiculous yeah yeah absolutely um yeah it's it is it's so wild how it's like i feel like there's a set of rules that they operate by but then as soon as any kind anytime there's like a threat to the rules then it's like they can just change the rules at any time you know it's um yeah it's pretty bizarre wait there's like a last little bit down here um the express has informed city of london police the met police and the london stock exchange of palestine actions plans we have passed on our evidence to the metropolitan police for further investigation a city of london police spokesperson said the allegations set out in this reporting represent a conspiracy to commit serious offenses and cause unacceptable disruption an investigation is underway to establish more information and to determine what further action should follow an appropriate policing plan is in place and there will be an increased police presence in the relevant area to deal with any incidents the London Stock Exchange and Met Police just declined to comment. So this is um, before, obviously, the arrests took place. Six of them were arrested. Um, five of them were let go, but one of them, who I'm assuming, I'm pretty sure it was um, the guy Diamat, um, you know, has has been charged. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because um, it's, I mean, like you could tell like this dude was just doing this for a story. Right. And kind of, I wonder if, um, I wonder if this will actually shake out to be more beneficial for them to be arrested before an action than to have gone through with it anyway, because there's a weird public opinion thing with any time anything like this happens, you get a lot of weird kind of, you know, stuff in the media and the public and stuff going like, oh, you know, like they're so annoying. What are they doing? Blah, 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 like that. But then like stories like this, I think actually as like one-sided this is, there is like, there's a lot of information in here that I think is useful to other activists, but also just to the public in general. Like you still get an idea of what was going on here. You get an idea of how it's like, like what they were doing had a very specific purpose to hurt, you know, like this, like hurt hurt the financial element of, um, of Albert systems. And um, like, I wonder if that could even end up like when this goes to trial, garnering a bit more public support for them. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it shook out that way. Whereas I think if they had done the action, there probably would have been a couple of days of news being like, look at these, you know, these idiotic lefties or something like that. And then it would just kind of go away. Um, yeah. So I guess we'll see how it goes, but um, I know that there are, I mean, there have been uh, different activist groups that have taken advantage of arrests in that way and tried in public trials in the past and used it as an actual platform to actually talk about what they're doing. And um, yeah, I think um, just because 
just because they've been arrested just because one of them was charged i don't think that means like that is an unsuccessful action um it just means that the plan changes i guess so um yeah we'll 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 be following this to see how it goes um but one of the main things here is how i guess like like we wanted to talk about the operational security and information security and stuff that went into it. And obviously we've been like talking about little things in this story as they pop up, like little bits here and there where we've noticed things that they've done that were good or things that they could kind of, you know, expand upon or anything like that. Um, and yeah, I think um, we could probably just carry on discussing those kind of like little things like that. Um I think like like what, what we've been talking about a little bit is the way that the internet and social media and um, <laughs> direct messaging and stuff has kind of changed the landscape for a lot of this stuff where it's become a lot easier to organize without being together. But it has also opened up a lot more pitfalls, a lot more traps, um, a lot more things to be wary of. Um, so, I mean, we can see in this case, they were using the app Signal to message. So Signal is a direct messaging app that uses end-to-end -end encryption. So um, encryption is basically, you know, like it's, it kind of encodes your messages. So normally when you're sending a message along the internet, um, it, some, some things don't encrypt anything at all. There is a lot of places there is like a kind of obligation to encrypt certain kinds of data due to like legislation. For Signal, what it does is it um, encrypts it on your end in the Signal app, sends it over the internet. And then on the other end that they're, um, you know, on your friend's phone or whatever, they de-encrypt it there. So if this information is kind of um, intercepted in any way in the middle, it can't be read. Oh, well, there are circumstances where they can decrypt it. It's just that it takes a lot of time and effort and in most cases, it's not gonna be worth it. So the only way, um, the only way for them to read the messages would be to, to actually have, you know, your phone or the phone of the person that you were messaging and to, you know, legitimately just, access the account to read it to see what the messages say um Sid signal does have things that like i think periodically you have to um you have to input it's like a code or something like that that they give you just basically to like keep unlocking it over time um and you can have um i think you can through the app you can specify further encryption for specific conversations and things like that so that kind of stuff is quite good because um if you're sending messages like this to friends if you say hey we're gonna go you know we're gonna go cut the head off the captain cook statue on uh, february 14th or whatever then if you're sending that via text message you may as well just you know like you can you can you can say that it's not safe. Like you can't guarantee that someone is going to look at it or anything like that. Like, but you may as well just have, um, you know, just, just written it on a wall somewhere and it's just up to the cops to find out what wall you wrote it on. You know, they just, they basically just have to see where you were, what phone carrier you are on. And then they can look in the records and be like, Oh, here we go. This number sent this at this time blah, 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 this is what they're going to do. Um, and it's very easy for, th for them to do that. But through Signal, it's a lot harder. But we can see that also this journalist had access to these Signal conversations. So that's the other thing. You have to be really careful about what you're saying in there. Um, you know, like it's, if you have some kind of like coded language or something like that, that would be ideal. Um even then like i would i find that most people aren't that paranoid about that it's more about vetting the people that gain access to the signal groups of conversations in general there's also um people use telegram for stuff like this as well again just vetting the people that gain access to it is is more is probably more crucial than using any kind of like coded language like meet the white lady at the airport or whatever like that you know um and um 
so aside from yeah like aside from journalists obviously there's 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 plenty of threats that you could have you know aside from um there's journalists there's um if it is something that is going to be you know illegal in some way then there's police task for task forces that uh set up to to monitor left-wing activity this is like you know true in basically every country in the imperial core um they'll usually have some kind of um activism task force things like that they'll be familiar with the the lingo they'll know like, all that kind of stuff usually it is still very like hello fellow kids sort of thing but like you know you still you have to be very wary of anyone um who approaches you even online people that message you saying hey i really want to get involved with this even in person um there is a you can usually like there's cops have a certain look they have a vibe they have a way of they have mannerisms if you've been around them enough you will you know you'll learn to kind of know what kind of people to be suspicious of um it's always good to be suspicious of new people that you need to vet them. But um, yeah, be very, be careful of being overly paranoid or even potentially cop jacketing someone or fed jacketing. They say when you um, just because you have a suspicion, you, you know, you start telling people this person's a cop, you know, you have to be really careful about that because um, I have seen people that are just, absolutely not cops but a little bit socially awkward or something like that or even just having an ideological um you know difference to someone getting cop jacketed for ridiculous reasons and i think that that's that's been the death of a lot of good social movements um so you really have to be careful not to not to be letting yourself get too paranoid which i think is a very easy thing to do um yeah and um there's like we were saying earlier so like a journalist probably would lose interest after a little while without getting any kind of without getting access to anything without getting any results or whatever um some of these police task forces do have the capabilities just to have people working for months to years at a time to infiltrate groups um a lot of climate groups like a lot of kind of general green activism stuff in New Zealand has been compromised over the years by people that just, um, you know, they show up to all the meetings, they do all the kind of stuff. Um, a lot, a, a typical thing is being, um, they'll have a van that they can drive, you know, and I'll have a, I'll have a lot of seats and I'll have just, you know, and things like that, like, you know, and obviously not you know it's not just cops that have vans and know how to drive but usually it'll be a thing where it's like oh this is a thing that is often needed um that person would be a really valuable member to this group uh maybe we'll just you know like we can skip the vetting process for this guy because he seems good you know um and even multiple people gaining access over a length of time and vouching for others things like that um you know, there's uh, group, famous groups like in the past, like, um, yeah, like one of the big victims of COINTELPRO was a group called the Weather Underground. Some people might be familiar with. They're a pretty extreme, um, extreme far left group in America. Oh, yeah, they operated everywhere, but like uh, mainly in America um, who like they did a bunch, they even, you know, they did some really extreme stuff. There was like bombings and like kidnappings and things like that. But um, they were so COINTEL pro um, when it all got broken up, they just were like in extremely, um, extremely, extremely infiltrated to the point where there was like a lot of like really extreme things they do. And they were, did, they were like, oh yeah, actually, no, that was the, that was the fed that like suggested that we go and do that you know like things like that like there's often a thing um pushing like the idea of doing more extreme acts and you do have to be wary of that being like oh this guy says that we should just go and do this like we should he keeps bringing up we should do that but that's really dangerous someone might get hurt or something like that um you know and like that could legitimately be someone that is just like 
you know, trying to stitch you up, you know, like it could be a, it could be a cop or something like that. Um, there has been, there was one in um, New Zealand that infiltrated a couple groups years ago where he would do a lot of stuff. Like he would at protests, he would, he'd get on the, um, get on the megaphone, he'd get people to do stuff, to say certain chants to like, it was like one I remember where he got a whole bunch of people just to run down the street. And it was like a, it was a protest about raising the minimum wage. So it was a lot of young people there. Everyone did it. And then like on the news later, the clips that they used on the news were like, oh, that was the chant that he was getting everyone to say. And there was like a shot of all these like young people just running down the street. And it looks like they're going wild, you know? And it's, you know, and it's like, oh, okay, well, this guy was like later outed as a fed. And it's like, oh, well, he was he was playing his part in the the greater ecosystem. You know, the cops wanted to present these protests in a certain way. So they were able to convince people to do the things they wanted to do so they could portray them in that way. Um, yeah, like, so there's a lot of stuff like that that you really have to be careful of. Um, uh, the, um, the, what we mentioned a couple times and what they were doing by operating in cells is also like a really important thing to do. Like how we saw, so these guys, they were just doing their little action. There was a bunch of others to go during the week, but they didn't know what was going on with each other. Usually what will happen, there'll be these little cells, they'll be working all the little compart compartments, doing their own thing. And maybe one person from each one they will coordinate at the top. This is like the very, um, you know, like this, it's like a classic paramilitary structure. It's very classic with like organized crime and things like that as well, where they'll be like, okay, there'll be like maybe four dudes that all go off and they have their own people and they all operate se separately. They have a greater plan, but they don't know exactly what everyone else is doing they just reconvene occasionally to do that and then sometimes those people have others underneath them or they have like loose associates that aren't actually part of the group but they're like maybe a contact here or like you know someone else that can help in other ways um for bigger activist groups what you generally see is there will be cells that will deal with like okay, these people will deal with like the charity, like donations, all these kind of things. And then completely separate is the groups that will actually organize any kind of actions and anything like that. Because if the, the you know, like if the charity side of things is, I guess like, you know, like as, if someone, if someone that's like, if your accountant goes to jail, then you're kind of, you know, you can kind of fuck you. Like it's much harder to find an accountant than to find someone that will like, you know, lock themselves to a door, right? Um, so usually that is like completely separate, but that's obviously only with, you know, like activist groups that are, you know, working as charities as well. Cause that's, yeah. you know, there's not that many of them that actually do that. But um, so just making sure that you keep everything separate, but Having said that, there's also the idea of um, making things bus proof. So having everyone in an organization capable of doing everything that requires the, the organization to run. So whatever the focus of your activism is, whatever you're doing or whatever like that, if it requires people to have certain knowledge, <clears throat> it's good to be able to have the people that have that knowledge teach others in the group about it. Um, this is something we saw in, I can't remember the name of the book, but it was one that we read um, that was about the activists that helped get um, like uh, reproductive rights and like, you know, that helped with the original like Roe versus Wade and everything like that. And they were basically performing um like they were performing birth control procedures and everything like that. And they were teaching each other how to do it so that if one was getting in trouble or anything like that, you know, like everyone knew what to do. It was all, um, they were able to like, not just, um, I mean, not just for the strength of the organization, but it all actually made them better at their jobs at what they did because they were all kind of doing these things together. And um, yeah, and you know, I mean, that can come down to everything from like everyone learning how to drive to like everyone 
you know, everyone getting really good at making signs or like, you know, things like that, teaching everyone how to pick a, pick a lock or something like that, you know, um, things like that are really, really good. Um, but yeah, so, but then there's like the, the difference between learning skills and actually sharing too much planning information with each other right. from different cells and all that kind of thing. I think, <clears throat> I think this also like highlights the, the absolute need for affinity groups as well. Um, you know, organizations are one thing and they're great. Um, but really if there was going to be any kind of mass scale assault on capitalism, uh, fascism, neoliberalism, imperialism, whatever you want to call it, the, the, the big, world order that is oppressing us all you know it it would have to be by nature everybody operating not really in an individual basis but definitely in like a small isolated um you know way like you you couldn't you 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 can have an organization that is like okay yeah we want to build dual power like you can have an organization that is like okay yeah we want to build like tenant power we want want to build women's power we want to build uh, you know, worker power, but like, you know, the, 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 what do you call it? The agents of capital are going to know what that's about. Like they're gonna, they're gonna know, and they're gonna try and like, you know, basically like figure out, okay, what is this group? How much power are they actually building? Can we prevent that? Is there a way that we could do them with the law kind of thing? And they may be like, you know, trying to infiltrate you and stuff like that. But if people learn from those organizations and people take away those lessons, just like Tim was saying, and they operate not necessarily in a way that is part of those organizations, but they're still doing the same thing, then that's that's really, really important. Like, for example, and I'm not encouraging anyone to do this, and I would never encourage anyone to do anything like this, but what the Daily Express has done in outing Palestine Action's plans is, as I said earlier in the show, they are very clearly detailed exactly what you would need to do in order to shut down the London Stock Exchange. And if an affinity group wanted to, they could read what the Daily Express had said and go, we should do that, actually, in their own sort of like very, uh, you know, secure verbal meetings that are not on signal that are not on telegram they're not actually an organization that has any information about them anywhere uh, and they could go ahead and just do that like th this is the whole thing right it's like in if affinity groups are incredibly important affinity groups are like um very like present in a lot of places like for example in the imperial periphery like we hear a lot of reports of like um, affinity groups that shut down Russia's war machine, right? Like, you know, a bunch of anarchists that like, you know, wanted to derail a, a train or whatever and, uh, you know, set fire to like a, 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 a power station that was like, you know, doing shit for, for the Russian army and shit like that. And there's also like examples of this going on in like Israel, uh, you know, a bunch of like anarchists who like, you know, they were born in Israel. They they've grown up there. They don't agree with the with the the country's politics, and so they like take these little measures to like sabotage the IDF. Take these little measures to just like distribute leaflets and shit like that. And those things might be small, but you know that can like graduate to 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 more. I guess you know I don't want to call it a valid action, but but definitely more impactful actions. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that's important. Yeah. I think um there's yeah like speaking of actually like um you know speaking of different groups and organize organizational structures and you know you mentioned it's got me thinking about it you mentioned um anarchists and stuff like the also the um the way that you structure your org um is also another thing when you're talking about um, I guess like transparency and democratic structures within your organization. This is like something that is like way, like I think left-wing organizations are way more kind of, um, I guess like cognizant of this kind of thing. Whereas, you know, you get a lot of like kind of right-wing or like fascist groups and they're just like, 
okay, I'm the boss and you guys are, you guys are my little foot soldiers or whatever. Whereas like, you know, like a lot of groups, a lot of left-wing groups will generally start as like, they're like, okay, we are a Marxist Leninist organization. This is how we work. Or they'll be like, we are an anarchist organization. This is how we work. And there's also something to be said for just because you have an idea of how you want to structure society doesn't mean that if you are creating an org to get there, that you have to structure your org exactly to that same ideological ends. It can be like a work in progress, you know, like it can be like, this is the goal. And you could even say like, okay, and when we get to this point, that's when we're going to start doing this. Then we're going to change, ch you know, like you set up a plan, like we're going to change our structure to this as soon as we reach this many members or, you know, things like that. Like, um, you know, and um, generally what, you know, like a lot of people will do is like, say if they're operating a little cell, they will, you know, like vote democratically on things. And then, you know, the, whoever represents them at the next stage up, you know, they talk about that kind of stuff or even like, you know, the guys at the top, you know, the, the capos, some might say, um, you know, well, they, um, you know, like they might talk, like they might, um, you know, have some kind of vote between them. Like, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to the London stock exchange. We're going to do this. Um, you guys all go to your, you know, to your cells and you discuss which way you think is going to be, you know, like within your skill set, within your means, what you think you can do there. You guys decide on that and then come back to us. And then, you know, so there's, there's room for that level of like, you know, kind of input into democracy every step of the way, if you choose to do that. Um, other groups might be like, for the intention, for what we are doing, for, the um the circumstances and for the risks it's better for us just to have one person that kind of controls this and then no one else knows anything you know because to do the democratic thing on every level there has to be a lot more going back and forth of information whereas um yeah you know you see this a lot more with smaller um smaller groups that are a lot more focused they might just be like okay one person here knows the whole plan it's the only person that does nobody else knows the whole plan you know like you just know this little bit you just know that little bit we've got a master plan there's no there's no voting on it or anything like that it's just everyone has a job which you know depending on what you're doing that can also make sense you know that's like um yeah that's i guess like yeah and i mean there's like wiggle room there as well where it's like okay we do have a master plan and we're not really going to vote on it but everyone knows what everyone else is doing like i guess kind of more like an oceans 11 kind of approach but um you know like uh yeah there's you kind of have to decide what is right for whatever you're going to do whatever protest whatever action whatever social change or whatever you're trying to you're trying to do but yeah you definitely need to um this like a lot of people think that infosec and opsec is literally just like you know like what apps you're using on your phones and stuff but it's <laughs> also you know it is it is these other things like talking about organizational structures and all that kind of stuff as well um because also every everyone like imagine you're you're sharing your information with all these people and their digital footprint becomes your digital footprint because you are you're tied up in this thing with them so you know can you are you sure that you know like old mate that you just met last month isn't bragging to what he's about this action that he's going to do to girls that he's met on tinder you know like shit like that like um so yeah so there is there's significant risks to joining things like this um because yeah you basically have to think about it like that like uh there was when during our government's covid response we had this idea of bubbles like everyone kind of like just staying within a bubble and not interacting with other bubbles you kind of got to think about it a little bit that way you got to think like is this person there instead of their like you know contacting with other people and catching covid like are they sharing information with other people and are they compromising our bubble so um yeah so you really you have to you have to trust your little bubble you know um
Yeah, and so you can use various privacy tools, obviously, outside of encrypted apps. Um, VPNs are also popular, but there is legislation about those that is changing at the moment. Whereas, <clears throat> so for those that aren't aware, a VPN is like a tool that you can use to kind of hide where you are accessing the internet from. So you could be like, if you want to use, like if I'm down here in New Zealand and I want to use American Netflix, I can use a VPN to make it look like I'm connecting to the internet through, you know, various different things to make it look like I'm from America. So when I log in, I get the American page, I get the American shows or whatever like that. And you can route it through like, it doesn't just have, you know, this is like the same as like back in the day, a lot of people used to joke about like, you know, like I'm connecting through seven proxies or something like that. You could do the same thing with VPNs where you hide where you're coming from. But the problem is the companies that run, that run the software, these VPNs, they do keep a log of, you know, like it's, it's the same with the, a lot of messaging things. Uh, the police could, um, with a warrant, go to these VPN companies and be like, hey, show us who was using, who was doing this at this time. Because of where a lot of these companies operate from, um, there's, you know, there's this kind of thing where it's like, okay, so an American, an American um, company, well, the American police probably can't compel a Ukrainian VPN to, you know, share information with them. But there's a new law well, there's some new legislation that's coming out soon. That means that they basically won't have to. They'll be able to just kind of like, well, like they'll they'll have access to those lists regardless. So a lot of that kind of stuff is happening now, which is going to make VPNs essentially, in their current form, essentially meaningless um, for a lot of things. I mean, it's still fine if you're just doing the Netflix thing, whatever. But, um, so a lot of people are under the impression that a VPN will, will protect you, but it, it won't. Um, yeah. So you have to be careful of that. Um, yeah. There's, there's other things as well. Like, um, like we've got Friso in the chat mentioning Tor. Um, Tor is another kind of browser. That's what cl the classic one that people use for accessing the dark web or whatever. Basically um, the dark web is just the internet that is not indexed in the same way as the normal, the, the non-dark web or whatever. So um, if, uh, you know, like an internet service provider looked at your computer, they wouldn't be able to see what you were doing with the Tor browser. They would just see that you're using it. So, you know, obviously people do this for dodgy stuff. It's usually like where people would access things like the Silk Road to buy drugs when they're in high school. The thing is um, a lot of the mainstream dark web is just like, not what it says it's um you know it's a classic thing it's like it's it's largely honeypots these days because people log on to the dark web they're like i'm gonna buy some drugs or i'm gonna do some find some weird sex stuff or whatever and it's you know then there's like an fbi agent that's like hey i'm the drug man <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> because it's like you know it's it's the, the the people that do that uh you know it's like this very entry-level thing whereas like there is still these pockets in there of, um, you know, of things that operate outside legality. And if you are, you know, there are people that run message boards and private spaces in there where you could communicate with other people that, you know, like it would, it would be very hard for any kind of law enforcement to be like, you know, um, you know, to be like, okay, this was definitely this person here, unless you provided some kind of identifying information. But at the same time, people have used, Tor browser use as evidence before to be like to not be like okay this person did this specific thing or using the, the Tor browser but they're like okay well this person that we've got on trial for selling drugs online has used Tor browser for eight eight, eight hours a day every day this week you know and it's kind of like oh you know the way the way that I had Tor explained to me when someone was trying to get me into like crypto and stuff um yeah. i was like oh should i download tor i don't really understand and the guy basically said to me not unless you want to be arrested and charged with suspicion of being a pedophile yeah, yeah, pe yeah, yeah. all pedophiles use tor so it's like oh okay right yeah yeah, yeah 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 it's stuff like that like um yeah and it's like 
Yeah, I think it's one of those things where it's like people would find like some Reddit post and be like, yeah, to to buy, you know, like some crazy drugs or like, yeah, some like illegal kind of like exploitation materials or whatever like that. You just, you get tour and then you just type it in and you'll find it and it's on the dark web. And um, yeah, I mean, it's like a very idiotic thing to, you know, but like, I mean, I think the people that are doing this, they don't actually have an understanding of how this works and they just hear the dark web and they think like, oh, you know, anyway. Um, so yes, yeah, so you really have to be careful even when you're using these things. Yeah, the, the main thing that I think that people trip up on a lot of this kind of stuff is that to be really secure, to really practice good infosec and good opsec, it is inconvenient and people will try and balance the security and efficiency, but then most of the time there's some kind of leak that's because people lean too close to efficiency and they're just like fuck it we need someone else to help with this there's this guy that's been hanging around yeah sure let's get him in or they go like oh this person seems legit i think i know them someone else you know vouch for them or whatever like that let's let them into the the telegram group or whatever like that and then they're just you know whatever so yeah there's um there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that just comes down to just human error, just people slipping up, just a little thing where they're like, oh, should I have let that guy into the group chat? You know, whatever. So um, yeah, it's always good to like continuously kind of, um, you know, and I, I actually, I know orgs that have done drills before where they've just, you know, someone in the org is posed to someone else to be like, let's see if someone will let me in and then be like, hey, look, mate, that was me on Discord. You let me in and um, just... I'm letting you know now that that was, that was a mistake and we can't be doing stuff like that. So in the future, just, you know, like that kind of thing. Like um, some people take that really seriously and they'll run drills like that. But um, yeah, so it is good to en encourage a culture of that kind of security, but yeah, absolutely still be wary of, of just going, going to nut nut, going paranoid, cop jacketing people that actually mean well and all that kind of stuff but yeah 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 i hope we've done a, a good job of uh, explaining uh how you can practice good info second opsec in your org uh tim's done a lot of it so i really appreciate that dude um but uh yeah we do have one question it's from middle earth marxist in the chat um and they say do you see more value in big actions involving lots of people or would you suggest focusing on small scale guerrilla stuff which could be videoed and spread and maybe less susceptible to infiltration i think that this like you know this question is a little bit like i don't know like it, it it's the thing is is that all tactics are good of, of, of uh, having a variety of tactics is is cool and good and based and i think we should have more of that uh personally um you know less susceptible to infiltration i mean again what you've got to ask yourself is are the things you're doing in your org uh, are they things that you can get arrested for is your org breaking the law if if your organization is simply like a trade union who is trying to fight for like legal rights of workers and doing it within the um the actual like realms of the law then you're not you don't need to practice opsec generally speaking because you're not you're not doing anything illegal um you know what, what you have to ask yourself is like if, if there's a big action involving a lot of people is it legal can you do it um and if it's a smaller action again is it legal can you do it i mean the, you know the value question is like there, there is value in every action whether it's one person whether it's a million people um so you know that would be my answer tim yeah i would say um i don't yeah i don't the same thing i don't think that either particularly has more value um but yeah it does tend to be bigger actions generally tend to be I would say like less extreme and more within the bounds of the law. Um, you know, like we're talking like big marches and things like that. Um, it tends to be the more kind of extreme stuff, like trying to shut down the stock exchange or, you know, all that kind of stuff is tends to be smaller groups. Um, it's a lot safer that way, but also I think like, yeah, it is like, it is. Um, I think there's, a space for and what i think we're going to see more of with people um because you know you do see these groups like extinction rebellion and stuff like that and just stop oil where they're like 
huge groups that are doing all these little things all over the place. But um, I think we're probably going to see more from of that kind of thing, but probably from people that are, are more, um, I would say more radical maybe than, you know, groups like Extension Rebellion um, and see small scale guerrilla protests done at a larger scale by, you know, the same org, but different cells all over the place. Like, I feel like we'll, you know, like, especially over the last couple of years, a lot of people have kind of been radicalized and quite, I would say even more like, like galvanized into doing these things and um, taking it a lot more seriously. Um, I think that that is probably the way to uh, like enact actual, like real, very big solid change would be, um, yeah. Like, and I mean, that's what happened. That's what's happened a lot of the times in, um, over the years even for stuff like in new zealand with the um the springbok tour when um there was so it's a classic thing in new zealand history there's actually a couple of them when um south africa was still living under apartheid and new zealand and south africa always play rugby together it's always like this big thing and um a bunch of activists all over the country all these different groups were basically like shutting down gigantic rugby um matches and things basically to be like until the until the new zealand all blacks don't play with south africa until we say nah we're not doing it while they're still under apartheid and um you know it's all over the country like you know just these small little groups doing it small and it was like you know it was like groups of like communists and anarchists and stuff and they were like demonized in the press but like now everyone just kind of acknowledges like oh they were right they were actually really good and they <laughs> you know they they forced the country to kind of um you know to actually be like oh actually no we're not gonna we're not gonna play um with the south african team the spring box um and so that was, yeah, small scale guerrilla stuff, but on a big scale because there's all these different people all over the country doing it. Um, I think that's like, that's a good example of a similar thing that people could be doing against Israel because it's a similar thing, you know, they're like, it's genocide, it's apartheid. Um, yeah, and I think we will, a lot of countries will look back and they'll be like, remember when we we stood up and did something but it won't be <laughs> everyone you know like it'll be a small group of dedicated radical left-wing activists that really did all the work um and they, everyone probably hated them at the time <laughs> yeah and there'll be some horrific uh there'll probably be some horrible like career politicians that were like i handed out signs at protests uh you know shit like that so um for homework this week we um, didn't really discuss anything, but <laughs> have you got any ideas, Mule? Well, someone in the Discord suggested this, and I think it's um, I think it's quite good. I'm just going to try and find it. Um, so Eurovision are, you know, not really uh, very receptive to the idea of banning Israel from uh your the eurovision song con mm. contest even though it's it so funny like and it's so telling that like israel the middle eastern country is in eurovision <laughs> yeah, so yeah yeah funny. and as well and as well i always thought that i always thought oh, why isn't like you know someone else in it but you know also the fact that they banned russia because of the invasion of ukraine so you know th this this is the reality of it right so uh, New Zealand aren't in Eurovision and New Zealand is like one of like the English colonies, you know, and it's like, yeah. Isn't Australia in the Eurovision song? I don't fucking know. Like I watched it for the first time. Not a thing over here, really. No, I, w I watched it for the first time in my life, like th this year. And I was like, I'm a Eurovision queer now, but like, uh, you know, I'm not anymore. That's for sure. I knew I was right to be suspicious of it. Anyway, um, <laughs> so the, the BDS campaign, Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions campaign, um are asking people to uh you know write to eurovision send campaign uh, send uh, uh uh emails and all that kind of stuff email broadcasters and sponsors ask them to withdraw if israel will be allowed to participate um this is something that everybody can do doesn't matter where you are in the world um basically go to the bds movement website it's bds movement all one word dot net 
forward slash ban hyphen Israel hyphen from hyphen Eurovision. Um, and I'm sure you can find the, the information on the... Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. One thing that is um, also interesting is, so we talked about a little while back when we're talking about political art and all that kind of stuff. We talked about Eurovision a few years back. Um, so Iceland, um, there was a band called Hatari, who are this kind of like industrial band that like they have like a lot of themes about authoritarianism and they all wear like fetish gear and they're really ab abrasive and stuff they they went against bds and actually went to tel aviv to eurovision and competed there but while they were there they like were flowing up uh, throwing up palestinian flags like they snuck a bunch in they they even recorded a music video in um in the occupied territories with a, a well-known queer Palestinian musician and um, dancer called um, Bashar Murad. Since then, Bashar has moved to Iceland, which is also where Hatari are from. And he's actually um, entering Eurovision as the Iceland competitor this year. So he is a Palestinian queer artist that is entering Eurovision as, um, as the Iceland kind of um, entry. So um, I think that's going to be really interesting. Uh, there's a whole bunch of um, a whole bunch of Finnish and Icelandic um, artists have got together. They've, there's like um, I think it's like some kind of art artist union that they have joined together that has like they've got a gigantic um, petition. Like there's something like it's like thousands and thousands of signatures already to ban Israel. So it would be just like very amazing if um israel got banned and the winner was um a palestinian a queer palestinian artist um yeah so um so yeah big ups to iceland for helping out um yeah and in finland also helping out um that would be a great a great symbolic victory for um yeah for palestine definitely definitely so uh, your homework is to uh do that and uh, send some emails to those uh, sponsors and uh, broadcasters. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So, um, yeah, so that's it for this week. But before we go, uh, one last thing to talk about. So if you, uh, you know, if you, if you love what we do here, if you support the team, if you want to see us, do more of it if you want to see us be able to put together more um you know more different kinds of content and everything like that the best thing you can do is to go over to patreon.com slash red underscore planet and sign up to our patreon just throw us a couple bucks a month to help us support the show um and to help keep our our producer paid and um you know just keep everything keep the lights on around here We've got a bunch of different tiers that all entitle you to different benefits, different rewards um, for like different, you know, even if it's only the cost of like a coffee a month or all the way up to, you know, like if you can really set aside some serious coin, you get different stuff. Um, the first, the first tier, the lowest tier, which is $2 a month US, but $3.50 New Zealand dollars um what is it like two pounds is it two pounds it's two pound and i'm finally getting the actual uh i don't know if you knew this tim but like it, it wasn't displayed in pounds for me for the last two shows and i don't know why that is so it's been very upsetting for me <laughs> well so the first that first tier is sprite mode so get started with your support for red planet by becoming a sprite benefits include the sacred and forbidden knowledge that you are helping the red planet team early access to vods access to our red planet discord so that's just access to the discord where we just you know like there's a bunch of different channels in there about everything from like politics and activism to like world events and just like games and art and all that kind of stuff um but yeah or the next step up mule what's that that tim is goblin mode and it's eight pound fifty a month 
and I think that it's thirteen dollars fifty New Zealand dollars. No, it's actually seventeen fifty a month. It, does that keep increasing, or am I losing my mind? It's 17... I think it's like it's all over the place. You know, it depends. <laughs> We're just at the whims of the stock market or something. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> seventeen dollars fifty a month New Zealand dollars. Uh, everyone loves the goblin. We all get a little goblin mode from time to time. Complete your gobology by going goblin mode with everything from sprite mode. A pack of cool red planet stickers for you to stick in legal places and only places like that uh access to exclusive red planet discord hangouts uh that me and tim should organize watching the rest of yeah we should we should uh we should organize organize watching the rest of uh what was that fucking thing we were watching zeitgeist yeah we need to finish watching zeitgeist for everybody yeah so uh so that's that's all the benefits you can get from being goblin mode but there's another there's another mode tim and it's for it's for people who are feeling a little beastly <laughs> yeah well so the next one up is uh beast mode which is um it's 20 dollars us or 34.50 new zealand i'm thinking it's, for, it's what like 20 pounds you're close it's 17 oh you were so close so close with that last one so holy shit are you actually gonna go beast mode well then we can offer you all the stuff from the lower tiers and pin badges yep pin badges we are excellent new red planet pin badge literally everywhere it's completely cool and good to do so so yeah so everything at the lower ones plus the pin badges and then uh yeah there's one more tier above that which is only for the real sickos uh mule do you want to tell us a little bit more about that it's 85 pound a month it's a hundred dollars in the u.s and tim it is what is it it is 172 dollars a month 172 new zealand dollars a month and this is yeah this is this is the tier if you've really lost it all uh if all you have in your life is red planet you're you're absolutely sick to death of everything else you just need red planet in your life that's all you sustain yourself on then that is how much that costs and you can have that tier it's just for you and if you support us this much we can only really reasonably offer you all the stuff from the lower tiers and a very special thank you message at the end of every stream and it looks a little bit like this thank you to jbp nail on starfire queen pip cassie tastrophe and risk inverse you're our sickos. Thank you so much for supporting us. You're incredible. Don't know what we'd do without you, to be honest. But if I wanted to learn a little bit more about my co-host, Tim, where indeed could I find out that information? Um, you can find me in so on YouTube and, um, and Twitch. You can find me as Conquest of Dread. But then over on uh, t on Twitter and Blue Sky, you can find me as Dread Conquest. Um, yeah, I'm usually just shit posting on Twitter. I don't get on Blue Sky too much, and it's been a long time since I've streamed outside of the stream on Twitch. So um, yeah, I've been I've been busy. I've been actually what I've been busy with is another thing you can follow me at. Um, I'll just bring it up here. Um, I've been working on it for a while. I've mentioned it a couple times over the stream, but um. I've been working on a tabletop role-playing game for a long time now. You can go to twitter.com slash darkrpg2000 to see how it's going. But it's actually really exciting because I just recently actually got like a um, kind of proof print of just like, just printed out all the pages and had them bound to see like what it would look like at the print size. And it's like so hectic. Like look how thick it is. It's like 200 pages and it's like all like, illustrated and everything there's just like all this stuff going on so it's like so close to the end of that so if you're into um yeah tabletop games like you know like all like dungeons and dragons and shadow run and all that kind of stuff um check that out because it's really close to being done and it's um it's it's a lot of fun but um but that's enough about me and my things mule where can we find more about, where can we get more good mule content? Good mule content. Well, thanks for asking, Tim. You can get that from 
uh, linktree.ee forward slash DJ M U E L all one word. That's me. That's my name for all the listeners out there. Uh, yeah, I still got my Christmas video. That's the latest video that I did. Uh, it's about that chainsaw landlord, Samuel Leeds. He's a piece of shit. And you can find out just how much of a piece of shit he is uh, in that video because, oh boy, that video was meant to be about three different guys, but it ended up just being about him because of all the <laughs> mad stuff that he does. He was enough of a guy for all of them. Honestly, he was enough of a guy for that entire hour long video uh so yeah go check that out that's on my youtube uh i'm streaming regularly again on twitch but i'm also doing like a simulcast uh uh, uh which is on twitch and youtube so if you follow me on youtube you'll find the stream but people tend to enjoy it more on twitch uh i'm also on patreon there's a lot of exclusive content that you can find on patreon like my movie reviews uh also some behind the scenes stuff as well uh, i got some behind the scenes stuff about my new video that's coming out soon i'm not sure how soon it will be because I was supposed to film it this weekend, but I was a bit sick yesterday and run down, so I couldn't do that. So, uh, yeah, I I am not sure when that's going to come out, but for more updates, check out my Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash DJ M-U-E-L. Uh, the new video, I can tell you, it's going to be about AI and uh, how it sort of relates to politi- politics, political thinking, capitalism, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so, yeah, if you want to check that out, that'll be out soon maybe beginning of february something like that uh but yeah and also let's not forget our missing host co-host the sweet kira chats uh please 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 go and support her um it's been you know a a, a pretty horrific time since kira was banned on twitch and uh she's you know understandably feeling like horrible about it so please go and check out linktree.ee forward slash kira chats or one word um and you know just maybe send her a message or something you know find her on twitter send her a message tell her how shit it is that she was banned um <clears throat> you know make sure that she knows that you care about her and stuff because uh yeah it's 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 not fair and it's not nice it's it's you know twitch was was her whole uh thing and it's just like such a shame that she's been yeah yeah targeted in that way so that's that basically but thank you so much everyone for listening to the show and watching uh we'll be back next week with more red planet same red planet time same red planet place see you in the next one we'll see you there fingers okay. it's fingies there we go it. all right all right we got this all right partner